your mission, should you choose to accept it. How many lame podcasts reviewing this movie started with those words? Exactly one. Ours. Actually, that's probably not true. Probably several lame podcasts did it, but ours did it too. Ben, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to disavow all knowledge of Jake. It's a strange mission. Yeah, it is. Basically, don't accept. My mission is the same mission I accept every week, which is to play word salad at the beginning of an episode. <laughs> if you fail, Jake and I will disavow all knowledge of you <laughs> in this podcast. I can often see uh, by the looks on your faces that you wish you could <laughs> during these introductions. My name is Nathan, and I'm your host. I caught uh, myself there. <laughs> almost went back to that old stick. Almost went back to the old stick, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Everyone must be punished. Everyone must be punished. So this, I'm, I'm like the entity. <sighs> We're going to have to talk about the entity. We're going to have to talk about the entity. Oh. All right. Hey, I like this movie. I bet we all like this movie pretty well, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. No, just kidding. It's Ben. And you're going to introduce the other guy. It's Jake. Hey, what's up? Mission Impossible, Jake. What is your... It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can't. The past can never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. What is your baggage with this franchise? Oh, man, I remember seeing the first Mission Impossible movie right when it came out and really, really loving it. The Brian De Palma having a lot of fun with it. So I... you would have been... Mm, uh, 10, 9, something like that, 11. I guess. Is it 94? 96, I believe. 90, I was going to say 96, right. so I would have been about 12. Yeah. It's just the right age. Just I the right think, age to. For all kinds of things. For the movie to probably actually seem better. Not that I don't like the first Mission Impossible movie, but well, it, it hit, felt really adult and cool. It felt really adult yep. and cool, and it just had a lot of all the right kinds of things uh, at that moment. I just thought it was, whoa. So I loved that movie. I thought it was super cool, super fun. Just a nice little sort of thriller drama with some cool turns to it. I think I look back on it, it feels sort of the same way that I did about maybe something like Sixth Sense, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, where you're sort of piecing it together as it comes and like the gotcha moments of it all were, they hit, they were cool. I just thought it was cool. So that's my first bit of Mission Impossible baggage. My second bit of Mission Impossible baggage is that I did not watch any of the other movies at all, ever, until just a few years ago. Like, I never saw two. I never saw three. I heard they were bad, didn't care. You couldn't recreate the conceit of the first one, so mm -hmm. it was going to have to change anyway. And then I just heard Cruise wasn't cool at that moment, I don't think. I mean, um, if we're talking about... It sounds like you checked out on Cruise a little bit earlier because he was still cool around Mission Impossible 2. By Mission Impossible 3, Cruise is giving interviews about how we shouldn't take antidepressants and the Oprah couch thing is happening. And like okay. he's falling. His star is falling in the zeitgeist around 3. Yeah, I think I probably just felt too cool for Tom Cruise around 2 anyway or something like that. I don't know. Or maybe I heard it was bad. But for whatever reason, I didn't care about those movies at all. And then I heard that three was laughably bad. Like even my friends who liked cool, fun action schlock just laughed it out of the theaters. And so, three or two? Well, no, I get the two confused. Two is the one with the slow motion pigeons and all the John. Okay, Woo then two, two, two is definitely so. Two's the John Woo one. Yeah, yeah, two's the one that everybody was just like, "What in the world? This is so trash." And so I just sort of let that color my view of the rest of them. And I know that J.J. Abrams jumped in at some point. And I, like, I remember my interest peaking a little bit that Abrams got involved, but not enough for me to go see it or to rent or anything like that. Just mm -hmm. to interrupt it for a second, I think the timeline is interesting here. So 96, Tom Cruise does Mission Impossible. Tom Cruise is sitting on top of the world. 99, he does Eyes Wide Shut, Vanilla Sky is 2000, and Mission Impossible 2 is also 2000. So this is Tom Cruise, Magnolia, I think is 99 too. So it's like mm -hmm. pre prestige Tom Cruise, and Tom Cruise is pretty cool in the indie film scene, but also everybody's like, yeah. eh, can this guy really act and stuff like that? Yeah, and I then mean, I did... never saw any of those movies. 
Then he does Mission and uh, no, he does movies that I bet you have seen, Minority Report and War yep. of the Worlds with Spielberg. Yep, yep. saw both of those. Looks mm-hmm. like he's just going to be Spielberg's guy. And then he goes nuts publicly. The Oprah thing happens. This is in the early oddies, around 2005 or so. And yeah, I'm in college at that point. Right. And then Mission Impossible 3 actually hits in 2006. So when he's doing the press tour for Mission Impossible 3, he's getting asked questions and he's trying to downplay and he's trying to like, he's already in rehab mode. Yeah. So 2006, I graduate college, working full time and trying to get married. And I don't care about anything that's happening out there in the world. Right. So that, and that's Mission Impossible 3 timing. And so then everything else happens outside of that. And then at some point down the line in my early to mid thirties, I'm franchise hunting for fun, fun, cool action and decide to check out Mission Impossible stuff. Maybe I even wait. I don't think this is true. Part of me wants to say I might've even waited until I saw the trailer for Mission Impossible 6 and thought, wow, this looks super cool and fun. J.J. Abrams' very fun Star Trek movie would have hit 2009, I believe. So maybe you okay. Were and like, I oh. saw. I thought that was fun, and I thought that was worth seeing where that went. And then maybe you were like, "What else has Bad Robot Productions?" That's also possible. Done. Yeah, that's very possible. I can't quite put that timeline together. What I do remember is going back. Actually, I think you probably told me it's okay to skip two and three, just do four and five. And so I might have done that at one point. Then I might have gone, I know I eventually went back and did one, two, three, four, five, six, all in order. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think the only way to think about these movies is that there was a franchise that began with Mission Impossible 4. It took two trash films to figure out what it was. So Mission Impossible 4, 5, and 6 are a fun little trilogy leading into seven. And there is this really fun prequel where they de-aged Tom Cruise and a bunch of actors from the 90s called Mission Impossible One. And they did a really nice job with it, but it's sort of like its own little genre piece that stands apart from the rest of the actual franchise. So it's like, and I think that's what I'm going to tell my kids. Mission Impossible, it's just like Star Wars starts with episodes four, five, and six. Right. Franchise about people lying and creating false constructs. So you should do that for your kids. It's like a meta. Exactly right. Yeah. And then then they can piece it all together later. Right. Um, But yeah, so Mission Impossible, as far as I'm concerned, starts with episode four. Just so, and it goes on from there. That's the franchise. And then there's this like prequel that they did later with a bunch of CGI where they de aged everybody. My only quibble and, and, and is brought in Emilio Estevez. I mean, I feel like you're having your cake and eating it because the. <laughs> I mean, yes, you, I am. Obviously, you are Be- because uh, this... it's free country. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> it feels like Mission Impossible Three sets up so many of the quote unquote emotional through line. I mean, basically, it sets up Michelle Monaghan. So. I feel like you have to eat your vegetables. Like if I was doing that with my kids, it'd be like, well, here's the lame first movie, Mission Impossible Three, and then the cool sequels. And then the prequel. I think you who- can even get rid of four. I mean, f- the only reason you can't get rid of four is to buy. What? But- no. That's a good movie, though. I think four it is, is a good I think movie. four is actually the best. Four, here's, I think, why four doesn't live in my memory, why I'm almost tempted to agree with Jake's crazy take, is the ending of four. I don't like that whole car sequence. I don't either. Uh, I think the same thing. I think it's lame. I think it gets boring, actually, and it drags on. And so it's like, makes that movie feel not fun. I think... As, uh, in terms of actually being a good movie, like a complete movie that tells a decent story, has cool set pieces, actual style to it, I think five is the best. I need to go back and revisit four. Yeah. But I think five... You'll get your chance, but Is, is four... Yeah. What's his face? Four's Brad, Brad Bird. Brad Bird, it's, okay. It's, it's better stylistically than four. Four has like the prison break and Burj Khalifa and stuff like that. I mean, that stuff is... Right, Burj Khalifa is the reason. That's Dubai. That's the... I, I think that you'll find that the car sequence ages better. I may eat those words, but it may age better than you think. Like, you go back now and you may be like, oh, So I watched really the car cool. sequence because I had the same thought. Did I you? was like, surely it's yeah. not as lame as I... And I watched it and it did improve... On yeah. this viewing, but it's still, I was like, it's a pretty... It feels anticlimactic. This is something of a lackluster ending okay. to a cool movie. Interesting. All right. I think five is actually kind of awesome. I, I've been seeing nothing but, uh, on film Twitter, I've been seeing nothing but people ranking the Mission Impossible movies. 
A, there's a rehabilitation pro- project for number two, which I think is insane. What in the world? I mean, I actually, I was part of, I, I may actually be part of the rehabilitation project for Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. I'm sorry, it really does. You hold- are part of that. And I resented you before I ever saw. But I'm sorry, like, once you contrast it, you really begin to appreciate things like the fist fight with the ants sw- but swarming all them. that, all you're really saying is... You appreciate the fact that Steven Spielberg is still Steven Spielberg. Yeah, I do. His crap is better than other people's I'm like, best. Gold. Yeah. yeah, well, <laughs> it's like, am I happy that we have Steven Spielberg's crap instead of nothing? I think that by that standard, yeah, My answer yes. is no. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I'd, I'd rather not yeah, have yeah, it. Yeah, and that's how I have historically felt, but <laughs> I think I'm glad we have it. If we have to have Dial, then I think I want Crystal Skull to at least sort of have a good in memoriam. But anyway, the other thing that they've been doing is ranking them, and five routinely tops people's lists. I'd say it's the one that I've seen the most. And then <laughs> Fallout, weirdly, ends up towards the very bottom. Fallout's number six, right? Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes, I think that's wrong. Oftentimes, people will put it, yeah. which I, I think is crazy, but a lot of times people will put it number six. That's, out of the, out I of think six. that's crazy. I think that's crazy. I mean, I did not want to go back and rewatch Fallout after I had seen it. Likewise, and, but I, ha- I, 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 yeah, and I only rewatched it, and maybe this is like not so much baggage as context for how I saw this movie. I rewatched it. I saw it for the second time the day I went to go see Seven. You should just tell people what you actually did. It was a rainy Saturday, so, so you have okay. A good so so we had we had all these baseball games lined up, and I was like the point man on the baseball games, and storms came through. And we were just like locked in the house. And so I put on five. I'd never shown any of these movies to my kids except my older, my oldest son. Because my thinking is, I remember certain aspects of how that first movie made 12-year-old me feel. And I thought, this whole franchise is not okay for kids. Yeah. But five, in and of itself, doesn't have sexual content, or very, very little sexual content. At least less content than you would get in an Indiana Jones movie or anything like that, mm-hmm. for sure. Probably just some Rebecca Ferguson ra- wrestling. Yeah, she does her thing that everybody, every early Audie's action chick does, which she wraps, which her, she wraps legs her legs around somebody's head and slams them to the ground. Right. When she walks up, she walks up the stairs in a dress with a long slit going to the opera. That's the most that you're going to get. So I put on five... For the kids. And we watched it and we had a lot of fun. And part of my thinking behind it is, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to take Ian to go see Mission Impossible because I had such a fun time seeing Indiana Jones with him. And he was so disappointed by Indiana Jones. Such a fun time because of Ian's reactions, not because of Indiana Jones. Right. Right. I want that to be very clear for the listener. Yeah, no. Ian is just like, he's changing the way that I watch movies. Because he's just so fun to watch a movie with and to talk about a movie with. Like he thinks, I think he's at 11 years old. He thinks about things that I don't think about and sees things that I don't see. So I feel like I learn things from his perspective just talking to him about a movie. So it's like I'm having a lot of fun with that. I only really begin to discover how deep that well is with Indiana Jones, but I wanted to keep tapping it with Mission Impossible. And part of why I thought that is because he really knew that he wanted to feel like he felt watching Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time. And that was his hope going into Dial of Destiny. And I had a a hunch that if I put on Mission Impossible 5, he might get a little bit of that feeling and be surprised by it. And so I put it on, and the kid was just absolutely delighted with it. Like... I like he was just in enraptured. I think to the point of tears because he did have that feeling. Although he well, we can talk about this later, but his comparison point wasn't just Indiana Jones, it was actually Ten Ten. Huh. And he did not like it as well as those other things for all kinds of reasons that he was able to explain. But we watched five and then we watched six, and then I took him to see seven in theaters. And so the dumb thing about I mean, the dumb thing about that is you can only take so much. I compared it afterwards to to going to a theme park 
eating a bunch of cotton candy and hot dogs and riding the same one roller coaster yeah. 12 times in a row. Right. Right. Like the first time's fun. The second time, and you're excited and you want to get on it the second time. And then by the 12th time, you're like, why did I eat all these hot dogs? Why did I eat all this cotton candy? And why in the world did I think that this would continue to be fun? Like you can only handle so much of a roller coaster thrill ride without any substance to it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so it did sort of, I don't want to say poison, but it did bring down my ability, I think our ability to enjoy Mission Impossible 7 on the level that I think most moviegoers were able to enjoy it, just coming out of the drab, dull, stingy, joyless. Mean-spirited. Mean-spirited. Yeah cinema experience that's all of hollywood like but i do want to say that sort of watching watching a couple of these with the kids which i can't do with seven because there's a regrettable scene in it that i didn't anticipate but but in watching them sort of be along on the action thrill ride of it all Mm -hmm. really made me and you everybody who listens knows that i'm already a cruise macquarie apologist I'm going to be the guy who comes on and is like, Maverick is the best movie of the last 10 years. I don't care what anybody thinks. I didn't actually say that, but that's, the, you know, I'm going to be ready to make that case if I feel like I need to. But I really think that Cruise Macquarie are, they're the torchbearers, the modern analog to Spielberg Lucas, and that there's nobody else that's close. They are the true heirs of Spielberg Lucas. They're the guys that said, this is what, I loved about movies in the 70s and 80s. This is what was cool and fun. And I'm just going to make that. Like, I loved the action thrill ride that Spielberg gave me. And I'm going to, like, I'm going to make that. I'm going to put every dollar, every penny on screen. I'm going to stack my action set pieces. It's just going to be a roller coaster thrill ride. It's going to be super fun. And our interstitial action set pieces are going to be better than the centerpieces of every other movie out there. I'd agree with that, but it makes me mourn for civilization because it's like a guy on a trike is carrying the torch forward, which is better than the torch not being carried forward. (laughs) But I sure wish we had somebody with the actual legs of a Spielberg. Yeah, and I I agree completely with that. And, And that's like talking. Ian's not fooled. Like, I mean, he had a lot of fun with it. He thought it was really cool. He was surprised. He felt joy. He was excited. Ian, what's better, Indiana Jones or Mission Impossible? Indiana Jones. Why? Plot? (laughs) (laughs) He said, Mission Impossible movies don't have a plot. It's just beating up the bad guys from start to finish. Like, there's no plot. There's no story. And also, there, and then he like kept, he keeps talking. He's like, and there's no mystery. There's nothing exciting to like discover. The, The only thing it does better is gotcha moments. And they do cool gotcha moments, but they don't have a story and they don't have any mystery. They don't have any discovery. And he said, and it has a cool theme and they don't know how to use it. And that was another thing that I didn't like about Dial of Destiny is they didn't know how to use the music. They had the coolest music and they didn't know how to use it. What he does like, though, he likes the visual storytelling and the visual comedy. He loves the little moments like in in this latest movie where you're in the airport scene early on and everybody's trying to hunt down Mm -hmm. Ethan Hunt and they're like, he's got to be here somewhere. And it's an over the shoulder Mm -hmm. shot and he's running across. Yep. That's really fun. Mm -hmm. Like that's the, he's going to lock onto moments like that and be like, that was a really cool moment. That was super funny. I love that. Which Dial of Destiny doesn't do any of that stuff. No, no I mean, when I, no I, I, I asked him about the movie and he said the Ferrari, when it looks like they're going to get in the Ferrari or whatever it is, but really it's a stupid fear. Yeah, that like, was the other just, two. The, just the little visual gags, which Spielberg, of course, had a billion of. Yeah. <laughs> Even a movie like Minority Report, he's going to grab the jet pack and it's going to fry some guy's hot dogs or some uh-huh. stupid thing like that. <laughs> right. But uh, I actually started, like, we were talking about this, I said, I started filming it because I, I just have this like sense that people aren't going to be- like, I'm putting words in Ian's mouth. I've got it on video. Him talking about this stuff. Mm, one of those, like my kid told me that if racism continues, <laughs> exactly, in America, right, exactly right. That's what I keep imagining <laughs> listeners being like, listen, I have two kids older than Ian and kids younger than Ian. And they're all just like, 
movies fun movies not fun <laughs> it's just he, he's just wired differently uh-huh. and and it's cool and it's fun and but i'll try to keep turning my part on this podcast being the ian report but um i like the Ian report well, it's cool your mission should you choose but we got to get baggage from ben <sighs> ben oh man <clears throat> Saw Mission Impossible as a kid on video. I don't think I no, I didn't get to go see it in the theater. At least, no, I don't. Have Did any of you that. guys watch the TV show? By the way, no, no. no. I knew that. I knew like, of it. I knew. About I knew it. it existed. I knew yeah. it was Mr. Phelps, right? Et cetera, et cetera. I didn't have any context though to be like, like my dad was not happy. That's right. Yeah, but what can they you did imagine the Phelps. annoying internet culture, what they would do now with something oh, yeah. like that? They would have destroyed How dare you do this to my Jim Phelps? And I was like, yeah. guys, who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Anyway, but they made a fun movie. Saw it, thought it was great. It was one of those movies as a kid that I never tired of watching. That's my memory. Like, yeah. It was, and I feel like you could go back to it now, and it's such a nice piece of style construction that it would still basically work. Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I, th- I haven't gone back to it for a long time. Saw it, loved it. Would like if I was at a friend's house and they were like, "What should we watch?" I'd be like, "Let's rent Mission Impossible." <laughs> so I would be that kind of kid with movies that I liked. And then saw number two in theater for sure. I remember watching the trailers for number two over and over because that's what I did in those days. Is I watched trailers over and over. And man, how did you do that in 1996? We had dial-up internet. I don't know. Yeah, you probably no, had to it wait. wasn't. It wasn't ninety six from MI two. MI two is, is later. MI two is I want to say four years later. Nine, just three years later. Yeah, huh. it's not. <clears throat> yeah. So I. Yeah. Anyway, I would find trailer sites somehow back in the day on dial-up. Wow. MI two is two thousand. So yeah. I thought I was gonna say it felt like a long time later. Right. So they finally did it. So you would have had to slowly download the trailer. Yeah, it was and watch slow. Really it was. It was slow. Version. I would save it, and yeah, then yeah, I would yeah, just have yeah, it over and over to, again. Like. Sign into AOL, and then <laughs> <laughs> and then when and then when and then when people came mail. over, the, when friends came over, it'd be like, "Let me show you this trailer," because I would just do that. I would do that all the time. Sucka. So I would just watch trailers and show the, show them to people. I'd get so excited and think about the movie over and over in my mind. The Matrix was probably the prime example of that. No, that's not true. Lord of the Rings was, and that was quite a letdown to watch in the theater. Yeah, after of all the all ones you've the mentioned, build-up. the Matrix is the one that probably. Solved, you know, what was uh, the Matrix held fulfilled? Its head high. The Matrix yeah. held its end of the bargain right. with its trailers and stuff. It, it did not over promise and under deliver, but other movies did. MI2 definitely did. And then Mission Impossible 3 took a long time after that to come out. And Mission Impossible 3, I really disliked when I saw it in the theaters with friends. Disliked the action, disliked the dumb sentimentality, disliked that they tried to make me care about Ethan Hunt as a person. With a bad screenplay and a dumb romance. Just didn't enjoy it. No. And man. And then Mission Impossible 4 happened, and it was like Yay. a fun movie. A fun action movie that's clever, that has visual comedy, that has just all kinds of things. It's like you were waiting for this. The You're coolest, waiting for someone to figure this out. The best fuse. Like, best the fuse, best into the into the music scene. The best into the music scene. I mean, talk about franchise. opening credits. We were talking about yeah, that. Yeah, finally, a movie that, with a Batman movie. Like, yeah, we're going to make you excited for great. the movie. And every one of these does We're going to show you every single cool scene from this movie before it happens. And it's not going to matter. It's not right. going to matter. No, they no. They love doing it. And I love so much that they love doing it. And they love. It's great. Like, it's such it's a great, great challenge, right? Like. If you're going to make a movie and you have to be able to say, okay, we're going to put all our best moments in our opening credit sequence, and then we've got to deliver those moments in such a way that they hit. They still hit, even though they don't feel spoiled. They don't feel spoiled. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I do want to say, I wish there'd been another wrinkle to the jump. Because they really did show the entire jump in trailers and documentaries. Yeah, I do too. too. Which made me expect, like, oh, he's going to have to do a even cooler thing once he's out in the I air. I agree. There, I think the jump was the jump was a huge letdown with how much they felt a little bit like clinging so, onto the airplane in Rogue Nation where to me, you just saw like he's going to cling onto the airplane and then he does. There he is. He's clinging onto the See, airplane. I Great. did not yeah, I did not have the disappointment because I just wasn't there for it at the start with the airplane. Right. With well, the that's, airplane? That's yeah, yeah, that's right. But definitely with the motorcycle jump. It was basically it was just ruined by the trailer and all the sort of feature check it out ahead of time stuff I, right. I i think i avoided a couple of those feature check it outs i actually was like totally there for it in the theater i was surprised i was like i don't care about this dumb jump then i was like this is awesome 
<laughs> well, you made the the right decision, which was the conscious decision to not care beforehand instead of think, oh, this is going to be so cool. Here comes the I jump. Was, yeah, I was like, this isn't going to be that cool. And then I was like, man, that's a really cool jump. It just kept He just kept falling and falling and falling. I think I didn't expect that to go on so long. And I thought, I uh, it works. It works, especially if it's not spoiled. Right. So come on, guys. Yeah. Don't, don't, give, don't give us everything. Yeah. It would be nice to see one of these movies where you didn't know that the big thing like that was coming. I, I, I would that. love that, that. That so would have been much. If we did not, like if we never saw that motorcycle jump coming in. Well, actually, I think they would sell more tickets, to be honest. Yeah, because word of mouth people would be like, there's this great thing. It wasn't even in the trailers. Yeah. That's how they used to people do it. People get like, so excited. You don't get to see the dinosaurs till you buy your ticket for Jurassic oh, Park. Man. That's yeah. how they used to sell movies. People like Anyway, Ben, your baggage. Well, let's see. Rogue Nation. I was pretty excited. I felt let down by it because Christopher McQuarrie was editing stuff too fast. Couldn't see what was happening in fight scenes and stuff. And then you got Ilsa killing the big bad guy. And I was like, not there for that. Really didn't enjoy it. I bet I would like it a lot better now if I went back to it. But I was just sort of annoyed at the time. I was like, Brad Bird didn't edit too fast. Why do you, why? And then number six was really fun. But I had the same reaction that Jake did, which is once was enough. And then I saw it again, like right away in the theater. I, did I don't too, know why. It was such a mistake. And it was yeah. like, I feel sick. Like, I just, I can't. I feel, I feel so like the boring. life has been yeah. drained out of me. Yeah. Like, I can't take it. This one, actually, I don't feel that way about. I feel like, no, I'd see this one again. I feel it's, same, I'd be okay. Same, yeah. I think the other one, it tried to wring so much out of you in terms of its Ethan Hunt and his his marriage and his angst. And it just tries to pull pull that six, out six, of you. Six did? Six does, As yeah. I, so I, I would say that the reason not to go spend too much time with Six is, is just, like, it's just action until the very end. Maybe that's true, too. But it does have, like, it still has the coolest villain death. In the whole franchise, that's, great. that's, that's the coolest Bill and Death of in whatever decade that came the out. Best, this is dumb. Is he the best of the villains? Just the yes, most he like, is. I yeah. don't think like, Mr. Possible has that great of a track record with it villains. It doesn't, but, but Henry Cavill's awesome. Well, so I mean, but then you also have what's his face reprising his role. Oh, right, yeah. No, that, yeah, that, he's, I, all, I, I he's that awesome. Guy. What's his face? Sean, uh, his Sean, Sean Harris? Harris, yeah. Sean oh, sure, Harris. yeah, he's good. Sean Harris is really good. He was great, Having he them was both great in the movie. He was great in five, and then he was. He was. Do a total, I've been in prison and tortured in Gitmo makeover, but I'm still the same guy. I like that. In six. I, I, like that. I never really liked thing. the conception. He was. He felt like such a Daniel Craig Bond he kind did. of. He did. Uh, he definitely did. You're a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond slash Hunt, the kind of guy that is. But I don't care. <laughs> like, I don't care about that. Like I, I don't that, care because it's a ripoff. I care because it's boring. In either case, like, okay. I just don't like it as a thing. All right. Well, I'm fine with trends. I just, I think I'm fine with trends. Maybe I hate trends. I don't know. <laughs> Only if they're the right trends. <laughs> oh, man. I, so we got yeah. done with five and I turned on the trailer for six and I wanted to go find whatever Chip and Lance thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, did. man. Yeah. That's, probably That's right. So buried bad. in some episode. Yeah. And I knew that I would have no hope, excuse me, no hope of finding it, but I wanted to go find it because. Oh, yeah. That was super. I mean, we just did that trailer. We had a great time. Yeah, yeah that, that was, was a fun. lot of fun. That was fun. The invention of Claire. That's right. So my baggage is I'm I'm like oh, maybe a year younger than Jake, two years younger than Ben, whatever it is I am, and I think that that actually made a big difference to seeing Mission Impossible just being nine instead of eleven or whatever I was in '96. It felt kind of a little bit over my head. I could not follow what the disc was or why everybody wants it. I still think of it as a completely indecipherable movie. With that's really cool and has that the knock list, man. Yeah, the yeah, knock, the knock list. list. I remember. <laughs> yeah. How do you forget? Man, I hate the MacGuffins in the Mission Impossible series. The knock list, the rabbit's foot, the at the time, the key. at the time, having that MacGuffin was pretty fun. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm sure I would like the Brian De Palma espionage element of it more now. And at the time, I think my favorite movie at the time would have been The Fugitive, which has a very complex oh, yeah. plot. Of all the medical records have been swapped and stuff. Or Hunt for Red October was another favorite of mine. I loved those kinds of movies at the time. This movie opens with fun Hunt for Red October. October I know. I saw the same thing. Which was really cool. I just watched Hunt for Red October for the first time in the last month or so. It's a very similar construct to a certain thing that happens in Hunt for Red October. Several like, things, yeah. right? Even just like the two missile keys, even yeah, the two missile keys. The we're gonna open in Russian 
with subtitles, then the subtitles are going to shift. Can we zoom in somebody's they're, mouth? And, yeah. yeah. Are they going to start speaking in English with a Russian accent while we keep the subtitles and then drop the subtitles? Which I thought watching Hunt for Red October was a really cool... Is the only way to get around the fact that we have a Scottish dude playing Sean Connery, <laughs> playing our <laughs> Russian captain. Yeah, yeah. So Mission Impossible One always felt a little bit over my head. Obviously, I loved the gum and the ex- helicopter and the channel and all that stuff. But Mission Impossible Two, I knew it was crap. But by that time, I had seen Face Off and Hard Boiled and all the classic John Woo Hong Kong films, and so I enjoyed it on the level of slow motion schlock. I liked the pigeons i liked the motorcycle dueling all that stuff i liked it too i thought it was cool and i still think that that movie might be some kind of i I don't think the internet's like trying to claim it's good it's not good but it it might be an accidental camp masterpiece or something like that it's pretty funny and and you do have tom cruise and his full sort of long hair climbing up a mountain just vanity gq kind of mode and it's it certainly captures something it's positioned right 2000 in between the Audis and the nineties. And it's, there's nothing else like it. A mission <laughs> so three- my brother had that exact phase. Yeah. And he's like, Oh man, that's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> that's all you should sounds like. That's all you should say about that on record. Mission Impossible three. I remember feeling about it the exact same way that I felt about force awakens and about star Trek, which is, Oh, JJ Abrams is good at, jumpstarting franchises i mean i think i thought that even without the context of the other two i just thought like hey, this is clever the way that he builds these things i don't under really understand why you guys hate it as much as you seem to it's not a bad movie it's just a boring it's boring that's it, why it's it's just not i so i think the main thing is uh you have two movie like we're gonna act like we're in a drama yeah. about the character who is ethan hunt for right. good substantial portions of this movie and we're going to lose any sense of fun or yeah no i i agree i agree it's bad and the action's bad and the the bridge thing was kind of cool the bridge thing was cool but i mean isn't that enough for me to hate it like if all the relationships are actually dumb yes and then the ending is dumb and the whole fake out ethan's about to die or that was like uh, cheap tv uh, slow motion yeah it's very and starting in media rest is the cheapest tv writer's trick of them all yeah yeah so it, no it's not a good movie but it's exactly as good as that stupid star trek that everybody loved or that stupid force awakens that everybody loved i thought star trek was definitely more fun i uh, doubt that you guys would actually like that star trek if, if you were it, no, if we it's fine back, you're, you're, well, you're probably it's, right yeah but it's but just it was, a very it's just a cynical more, filmmaker but, saying how do i put these pieces together in the way that both dad and son will like this okay okay so but part of the what was worth being excited about with either star trek or force awakens is the promise yes right and so you can look at i don't think anybody looked at those movies at that moment and said ah these are great movies or these are masterpiece movies but what they did do is say look at all of the possibilities for where this franchise could go like the foundation's been laid doors have been opened possibilities exist to be excited about like we could have a really cool fun reboot of star trek and get star trek movies that are actually good and that we care about we could have a really fun like new this movie will only be interpreted by force awakens will only be interpreted by what comes next so what comes next could be really cool and fun and then this movie will be considered a genius foundation <laughs> It's literally the J.J. Abrams TED Talk, the, what is it, the box, the, he, there's a famous TED Talk where J.J. Abrams like, this is my storytelling thing. And he says, he calls it the secret box or something. And he talks about how we didn't know what the smoke monster was in Lost. We just knew we're going to throw out as many things, as many riddles and people will be intrigued by it. And they'll have fun talking about the riddles and the possibilities. And then he's never once been good. At actually delivering on the promise. No, I, and he's proven that over and over and over again. True, and I, so now there's no reason to ever be excited about anything J.J. Abrams does. Agreed. Mission Impossible Four, obviously fun. Mission Impossible Five is probably my favorite. Love the opera scene. I think the opera scene is in and of itself a better scene than almost anything that this franchise has done. I think so too. I, I think the moment everybody begins to arrive at the opera, 
it's just it does such a good job of of it's visually the shots the setup yep yeah it's great you're only gonna see yeah and then, yeah and then it has a genuinely clever payoff instead of just a people punching each other kind of payoff yeah. i where, where you're thinking with the character i love that i feel like a wife when it comes to this franchise in so far as wives don't actually care about movies they just want to have fun and then they don't do not remember the movies they just engage with it as a fun thing that is happening and then they forget all about it like i could go back to five or six i haven't seen them since they came out and i could probably not remember anything but a handful of the stunts like i do not care about ethan hunt i resent being made to care i resent (laughs) how much brooding even this new one felt the need to do like who cares I've, well it's not so much who cares i'm willing to care but you don't care filmmakers you don't care you retcon this character every other movie uh, yep. if mm-hmm. not every movie yeah they did it again in this one they do this whole ridiculous backstory that so, has nothing to do with the other movies yeah yeah you, you, there's a reason why that's in there and it's not and why it doesn't make any sense do you know what it is what's that so the the whole initial opening sequence was supposed to be they really wanted to play with de aging Tom Cruise, and so they wanted to have a cool opening action sequence oh, okay. with de aged Tom Cruise, and they they had it and they had it all done, and so I just was reading Macquarie talking about this like they had it all done they kept improving it, and at a certain point Macquarie said I realized it was not it's not possible. For me, for the average moviegoer, or at this point in cinema, to have a digitally de-aged scene that's actually about the scene, that's actually about the story that actually is contributing to this story, the only way to have a digitally de-aged scene right now, with where we're at in the technology, where we're at, where I, or at least what we're capable of producing, what I'm capable of producing, and where we're at in this moment of cinema is a scene where you are constantly judging the de-aging technology. This looks good. This doesn't look good. This looks like, this looks real. This doesn't look real. This looks perfect. This looks uncanny. And I had to go to Tom and say, this is just a big distraction from the story that we're trying to tell. We created this whole thing just to justify putting this in here and we're not ready. And it's just a big distraction. And so we have to cut it. Yeah, well, I wish that they'd cut more of it then. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But I mean, then you lose your Gabriel, all that stuff, I guess. But also, who cares? But yeah, that whole backstory thing was like, I mean, they had so much other backstory they could have mm-hmm. could have worked with or worked around. Like, we didn't need a justification for any number of things. But it was all there because they wanted to do a cool, fun, right. de-aging thing. And so that's what it and that's the, another fault of this franchise. It just builds like it takes what are the set pieces and then how do we construct a narrative to fit all of the set pieces we want to do in. Mm-hmm. And there's something really cool and generous and fun about that from an action standpoint. But man, they just don't give a rip about plot or story because of yeah or character and i don't think it has to be that way i think that they could which is why if i have any resentment about this movie it's and about this franchise it's the slavish kind of thank you for saving cinema tom cruise like the feeling everyone's just so excited about it 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 as like a great thing and it's like there should be five of these every year this is crossing what should be a low bar and so i'm thankful that it exists i'm sorry that there's not more of it i need to be grateful for what i get but also, let's not pretend just because we're starving that this is a gourmet meal. It's not. Right, there it's are not. things. There are still things that are wrong with it, and the things that could be improved. And we just don't have to be so slavishly grateful. Uh, it's kind of how I felt about Maverick. It's a great movie. It's a fun movie. It saved cinema. Whatever. But could it have used a screenplay? Also, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Uh, Maybe in that case, not. But I, you know, the only character that. So I I just I think we've said this before in other in other shows. Context really does matter and the context of who you're watching with matters. Watching this with my kids, the character complaints kind of fade. And I think that Cruz as the lead is lame. He's no Indiana Jones, he's no any number of other more colorful, interesting leads. But the but Benji and Luther and the supporting cast that are just sort of like a colorful like Sala or like short round or 
like Marcus Brody, they hit just fine. They get the job done just fine. They're beloved. Like the kids really like them and respond yeah. to them. Well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I don't um, think I don't. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Great. I mean, I, I think this movie does. I think Tom Cruise has done well. It's sort of annoying that there's always a couple additional teammates that get jettisoned every movie and deserve to be usually unless they're Jeremy Rennie Renner, who probably just they couldn't work out a deal with or chose whatever his star went a different direction. Yes. But, Marvel was taking up too much time, or he wanted too much money, or sure. well, the only reason Renner ever did it, the scuttlebutt at least, is because they were going him, to hand right? it off, and halfway through filming Mission Impossible Four, they're like, "Nope, this is Tom Cruise's movie," basically taking it away from Renner. So he tr- tried to get Born, they took it away from him, even though I <laughs> like that movie, and tried. I'm the one person on the planet that likes that movie, but I do like it. And then he tried to get Mission Impossible, they took it away from him too. But at least he got the hot guy Disney Plus show. <laughs> and then he got hit by a snowplow. So that's Jeremy Renner's story. Yeah. So where are we? I guess we're still in my baggage. I keep baggage. screwing up baggage. I'm no, sorry. That's fine. There's, there's lots to talk about. I like these movies. I kind of resent the slavish devotion that some people seem to have about them, but they're good. And I do understand the that Bob Iger and Kathleen Kennedy have gotten out of the business of doing things fun. They've also bought up half of the fun things. And so. It is very, 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 very refreshing to simply do something fun. And that is what you constantly hear about these. I think my wife, I think all the wives in America, but my wife is the one that I'm married to, leaned over and said, and I quote, this is fun while watching the movie. Mm -hmm. And she never does that. She certainly did not do that during Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny as the Nazi gunned down another innocent person and Indiana Jones was old and sad. Um and so, yeah, like the franchise, like the movies, don't ever, f- I still don't know if I'll go back and watch five or four again. I mean, I've seen bits and pieces and stuff like that, but it is a weird franchise in that I don't think about it. I don't care about it. I don't have any, I don't feel like I have a relationship to it. I think this is some of what Ian was expressing. I, I suspect like I, I have a relationship with Indiana Jones as a character. Yeah. Yeah. And with his friends as characters, yep. and as much as, I mean, Benji's a fun character, as you, but without an actual lead performance that anchors this in any kind of emotional reality that I like. Right. And they've just reset it so many times. It's like, even if you don't like Daniel Craig as James Bond, you understand the stakes of his version of MI6 and espionage. And like, you understand where you're at in the world. It's like, MIF now has been IMF, IMF, whatever they are. They've been like two or three different things just in the course of this franchise. Now they're the secret organization that we don't even acknowledge. I mean, I guess they've always been that, but. But they brought Kittredge back. They brought Kittredge back. It all (laughs) It all makes sense now. And (laughs) they brought Max back or Max's daughter. They brought Max back and then Max's daughter. Yeah. Yeah. They brought all kinds of people back it's because it all fits together. You've got the White Widow now. The coherent way, the White Widow, yeah. Oh, the White Widow. <laughs> <laughs> that felt like she feels like such a John Wick universe character. Right. Just... Well, they doubled down on that with whoever the samurai chick was in this movie. That John Wick feel. Like oh yeah, she just oh, feels, just feels yeah. like a John Wick Palm character. Although yeah, I, Palm Clementine. Although I actually, I actually liked Palm Clementine. She did great. Movie. I always like Palm Clementine. She's great in Guardians of the Galaxy. She's good in this. She's. Good in all kinds of things. She did. She brought a lot of character to that character without ever saying a word. I know, right? Yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty. It was pretty fun. It was, it was pretty, a pretty fun performance. Well, th- this movie did a bunch of things like that, where even the the two guys chasing Ethan Hunt like have their little bits of comedy and right. their personality, and you're like, oh, I like these guys. These oh, they're nice the, to have. I, I am F guys. I guess that they are. Oh, well, Shea Wiggum, I love seeing him show up in anything. I was so excited that he was in this. He's one of my favorite guys that glowers in the background. He's the main... Glowerer? The guy that's investigating Ethan or trying to hunt. The the guy over whose shoulder we see Ethan run. Right, okay. Yeah, no, that guy's just always fun whenever he shows up in anything. This this movie felt like it just had more of that. It just had a lot of, like, let's establish some comedy and some... some, tonal fun. And some tonal fun and some character. Yeah, I, I really appreciated it. Yeah, no, it's good. I don't. I don't want to complain too much about it. Like, it is very well done. It is not accurate for me to say that 
we would get five of these back in the day. Like there are things about this these, this movie that are superlative. That are special. Yeah, that are yeah. special. The action yeah. is special. Tom Cruise's commitment to certain areas of quality control are special. What's not special is the story, the exposition, the characters, the yeah. And there, mm-hmm. there just should be more fun movies. Like like Disney, when it strikes out, when it makes a bad Marvel movie, the Marvel movie should be at least aspiring to to be this. I think this is what I'm. This is all my complaint amounts to. Yeah, what I think is, I think I don't know. Maybe one of the most fun things for me is coming out of the movie realizing that I have forgotten and will never remember half of the action scenes. I feel like I've watched three action movies and I'm okay with that. Like, Mm -hmm. like just coming out the generosity in terms of the Mm -hmm. amount of time and care and money and quality that goes into every little shot of action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's really something. Well, listen, I promised people back in another episode, I promised people a Tom Cruise sidebar. So it is. it has now arrived. Let me explain. Let me explain. Wait. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. You may think you know what you're dealing with, but believe me, you don't. I'll try and keep this short but intense. <laughs> Get it? Because <laughs> he's really tiny. He's a small man. He's a small man and a very intense... Dude, uh, what, uh, this is maybe a piece of baggage that is worth exploring a little bit. So, Jake, you went through a Tom Cruise's stupid phase. Sounds like you basically just tracked with humanity's feelings on Tom Cruise. I think so. I think I've just sort of ridden the wave. I mean, I'm at a place like I'm not Tom Cruise's. I mean, I will say things like Tom Cruise is safe cinema because I think it's fun to say things like that, especially to you. Right. But what Tom Cruise has done is built a brand and it's a brand that he can hide behind. and no one will ever know who the real Tom Cruise is. It, but his movies feel like he loves you. Feels like he would just, that he loves making movies and loves making sure people have a good time. And that's part of the brand that he's built. So I appreciate that about him. I appreciate, I just love, I don't care what the reasons are. I don't care how cynical they are. It doesn't matter. What I like is going to, a movie where I feel like at the very least, this guy doesn't hate me or at least doesn't want me to feel hated. Right. No, this guy <laughs> he wants me to feel loved. You feel it's a good business proposition. He wants me to you're, have, you're entering into a fun. business with someone who wants to deliver a product and understands that he should deliver a product mm-hmm. in order for you to keep giving him your business, which is something that Kathleen Kennedy does not understand. Uh, ben, your Tom Cruise thoughts. I don't have many Tom Cruise thoughts. I, Huge interview I, with the vampire fan. I, I, uh, you know, I you know me. Shut. All yep. your favorite films. All my favorite films. Vanilla Sky. Yeah. Actually, unfortunately, I have seen Vanilla Sky. I don't know why I did it. I, it was an intriguing proposition back in the day. It was day. an intriguing proposition. It's kind of a gross movie. It is. It's, but It's stupid, too. Yeah, it's very stupid. Very badly made. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> it's just a bad movie. It's kind so, of intriguing, though, it, it is. while it no, it's, passes it, you by. Definitely. I don't... Man, what did I see Tom Cruise in when I was little besides Mission Impossible? Top Gun? Never watched it. Still have never seen it. Never will, if uh, I have my way. I, I don't know what else I saw him in. Stuff. A Few Good Men. I saw that in like my 20s at some point for the first time. There's got to be something else that I saw him in. Color I, of Money. I knew he was Risky a thing. Business. Risky yeah. Business. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're just naming Ben's all favorite great, films. All the great kids' <laughs> movies that Tom Cruise has made. Back Days of Thunder. The Outsiders. Man, I've seen none of these movies. That's amazing. Jerry Maguire. Never saw it. Okay. I, I thought he was really cool from Mission Impossible. I, my mom liked him a lot. Thought he was really cute. And so in my mind, he, he was stuck there as a cool star. And I guess that's it until we get to modern day Tom Cruise. Right. And all the, all the fun movies that he's been making for the past 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. He was in Young Guns. Never saw that either. Oh, he just was in a, he like had a little cameo as an extra. Yeah, he would have, guns. he was kind of part of that, part of that brat pack. He was or just some guy who got shot off a roof. I never saw Far and Away. <laughs> Tropic Thunder, I believe, another one of your Tropic favorites. Ra- never Rain, saw that. Rain Man? No, never saw Rain Man. The Firm? I like The Firm. I, I like Rain Man. I've I've seen, seen, I never saw The Firm. I've seen clips actually. from The Firm. The Firm's I've, worth I've seeing, the firm. I think. Or Rain Man, certainly worth seeing. This is so weird. I would have told you that I had certainly seen him in some other stuff. But Born on the 4th of July. Yeah, man, nothing. That is 
just weird. All right. Ain't got no more ideas. Well, Tom Cruise is, a, is an interesting guy because... Collateral. Collateral, yeah. Collateral is a great Collateral movie. is one of my favorite movies. I did see him in Magnolia, but again, this is when I'm... Is Collateral the older. one where he's, uh, he's an assassin, assassin and Jamie Foxx is the taxi driver? That's yeah. my favorite Tom Cruise performance ever. I think that uses Tom Cruise's sense of, this guy's a complete cold fabrication of a man to its advantage in a way that almost no other movie... It's amazing. ...has used, and it's good. And Vincent, the, the assassin, is is probably his greatest character. I do really like his enti- his horrible character, but a good performance in Magnolia, probably his best It was a good acting. performance. Yep. Kind of. I remember that. Yeah, he has a scene where he breaks down on his dad's deathbed that's uh, about as affecting as anything you could name if you've had a dad or had a bad relationship with a dad. That movie's all about bad relationships with dads. Mm. Um, huh. All right, Tom Cruise, though. Interesting guy. I want to talk about Tom Cruise. I want to talk about Scientology. I want to talk about how crazy this guy really is. Because we've all, as a culture, decided to forgive him, and I guess that's fine, whatever. But... Nathan's got the receipts. I've got the receipts, baby. (laughs) This is from a Rolling Stone article that I think is great. This is from back when Tom Cruise was trying to be self-revelatory. And uh, this guy talks about... I just want to read this quote. I think this sums up what's fun and crazy about Tom Cruise. Quote, and now here it comes, the famous Tom Cruise laugh. It comes on just fine. A regular laugh by any standards. You will be laughing too. But then when the humor subsides, you will stop laughing. At this point, however, Cruz's laugh will just be crescending, crescendoing, and he will be making eye contact with you. Ha ha, ha ha, he he. And you will try to laugh again to join him because you know you're supposed to, but it doesn't come out right because it's not natural. <laughs> he will squeeze out a couple of words sometimes between chuckles. In this case, wouldn't that be awesome? And then, as suddenly his st- as he started, he will stop and you will be relieved. I think that that... <laughs> did you see, did you, have you seen the... I'm sure everybody's seen this now a million times. The Ben Stiller. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. The Ben Stiller. I don't uh, think I have. This Ben Stiller shows up as Tom Cruise and just sort of like matches him pitch for pitch, moment for moment, his laugh and everything as he does it. And (laughs) I think, I think my read, like Stiller's doing, like Cruise has no idea that's going to happen. Right. Like he's just like, but Stiller has him. Yeah. nailed like the laugh the moments the and it's pretty great sounds like, pretty great i thought you were going to say that is great but i thought you were going to say the moment that's been going around now for a few months of the reporter squirting him with oh yeah, water. yeah no, no, no. somebody plays a prank like a prank show pretends to interview tom cruise no that's something <laughs> and then he just zeroes in and destroys the guy <laughs> and just says, like leaves like, him crying how dare you i'm giving you my time like i'm you're a jerk. No, I, <laughs> I was ready to listen to you and answer your questions. I was giving you my time, and you just decided to squirt me with water. Like here I am engaging with you as a human being. You're, me, Tom. I'm Cruise. a person. <laughs> right. Like, why do? You, why would you treat someone that way? <laughs> <laughs> You're a jerk. But it's hard to even. <laughs> I, mean, capture see, I haven't how, seen that in months. But man, yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's you, intense. Yeah, it's. And you uh, maybe some of us remember the you the recording that came out of him destroying a couple guys that weren't wearing masks, I think on the set of Mission Possible 2 during COVID. Like six. There's, oh. We're here to make movies and cinema's dying. And everybody on this job site, everybody on this set has families to feed. And you being careless can get this whole site or this whole set shut down and then people don't get paid. But it has that weird performative and, Tom Cruise oh, speech. Yeah. And everybody on this set. It has the rhythms of wow. what we think of as a Tom Cruise big moment, like a you can't yeah. handle the truth kind of versus Jack Nicholson type moment. And you kind of feel like, is this guy perform like he knows like, that this yeah. is gonna get out, doesn't he? Like this is That's, it does feel that way. He knows that actually part of his brand is being intense about something about saving cinema. Like if he's cinema's savior here, then he's well, gonna be angry at the people that threaten it. Well, you you saw that he had a big speech at the thing exhorting whoever listened to the Screen Actors Guild's concerns about AI yeah, and yeah, yeah. stunt huh. actors and things like that. Although the interesting thing see. about that is then he turned around and said, because the actors are on strike now too, and said, you have to let us promote our stuff too because right. theaters are dying. So 
this, this is, I guess, what I'm trying to set up about Tom Cruise. You can never tell where the calculation ends or whether the calculation ends or, or whether even in the moments where you feel like you he dropped his guard somehow or we got something. It's like this guy never really turns off. I mean, it's like no. his run. He just keeps going. He's a machine. He's a I think he's the closest thing to the popular conception of a pure sociopath that you could probably <laughs> you could probably name. I mean, at least in the in terms of what we see, like we we just we don't really know what's there. <laughs> it's he's a he always feels he has this uncanny sociopathic ability to feel 100% sincere. That's that that that's the thing. Uh, he, he has that politician's trick of if he was in this room, you would he would be magnetic and and I've heard like people tell story like if Tom Cruise is in this room, what he's going to do when he leaves the room to to go get lunch or whatever, he's going to come over to Ben, he's going to take Ben by the hand, he's going to look him in the eye. He's going to say his name. He's going to say Ben I want to thank you for podcasting with me. Then he's going to turn and do the same thing to me. And then the sun is going to go down as he leaves. And suddenly we it's all be... going to be timed. Right. <laughs> yeah. As his publicist, but it's going to feel like, like he just wanted to lock in and get people say the same thing about Bill Clinton. They say the same thing about Donald, uh, Trump. Donald Trump, certain level of popular celebrity, but with somebody like Trump or Clinton, you feel like you kind of know what these guys are underneath all of that and that's that's the weird thing about tom cruise i don't know that you can name anyone who feels as empty beneath i mean even somebody like i don't know who brad pitt or some of these guys will smith people that are micromanaged and that have these images chris pratt you feel like you kind of some grasp of who they are yeah you have some grasp of who they actually are and i suppose we could say we have a grasp of who tom cruise is but it's not pretty if we do uh that's my fascination with the guy Anyway, Thomas Cruz, Thomas Cruz Mopother the Fourth, was born in 1962 to his dad, who he described as a merchant of chaos. He comes from a Catholic family. He famously briefly thought about being a priest. His dad was constantly moving to find work. I'll let you guys take a wild guess. Does he have a good relationship with his father or a bad relationship with his father? Very close. <laughs> Very close, yes. <laughs> no, his father was abusive. Cruz has given interviews and said he was a bully and a coward, which is such a Tom Cruise way of talking about your father who was a bully and a coward. His father would beat him. His father was the kind of person who was tread upon by life. And if something went wrong, he wanted to kick the dog. And Tom Cruise was the dog and Tom, this is another quote from Tom. It was a great lesson in my life, how he'd lull you in, make you feel safe. And then bang, for me, it was like, there's something wrong with this guy. Don't trust him. Be careful around him. Tom Cruise was unable to read. He's dyslexic. And he had to take remedial classes away from everyone in his school. And here's another quote. They said, oh, he's dyslexic. I'm labeled. It instantly put me into confusion. It was an absolute affront to my dignity. I've got to figure this out. What's normal? Am I normal? Who's to say what's normal? I don't understand what normal is. It doesn't make sense. This is what led me to the study of psychiatry. I went and looked at it and realized all those labels don't mean anything. Labels aren't a solution. This is how Tom Cruise talked back when he gave interviews where he would at least reveal something about himself. He wouldn't give this interview now. But Cruz's self-mythology was that he's this empty fatherless boy who's completely cut off from the rest of humanity. This dyslexia thing really throws him for a loop. Finally, when he is 12, his mom stands up to his dad, divorces him. Tom does not see his dad from the ages 12 to 22. He only reconnects with his dad after he's started to have some success when his dad is in the hospital dying of cancer. And his dad says, I'm only going to see you, Tom, if we make a deal that we can't talk, say a word about the past. So he gets to go and see his dad die. But his dad, the condition of, to see him die is that you, we cannot talk about anything. Tom Cruise gets the acting bug playing Guys and Dolls at Glen Ridge High School in New Jersey. Decides to drop out of high school. Gives himself 10 years to become an actor. And immediately, yeah, I think he's just a beautiful looking guy and very intense and willing to work hard. So he pretty much... It does not take anywhere near 20 years. By 21, he was cast as one of the background punks in Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsider. And then that led to Risky Business. And then Risky Business is a huge hit. And Tom Cruise is a star at 21. 
And he kind of sets the formula that like Pitt and DiCaprio and now Chalumet and people like this have followed every se- ever since. And I think DiCaprio has been the most successful. Tom Cruise, as we'll talk about, was not successful in this formula. He eventually flamed out. But it's the if you're a star, you do one for them and then you put yourself in the hands of a great director like in DiCaprio's uh, case. It's been Scorsese. He does movies and th- Scorsese then gets to make the aviator or gangs of New York or a passion project for him, but he's got a big star. So the studio will sign on. So it's like, how can I use my celebrity to a get somebody to be my mentor, but B I'll, it'll be kind of quid pro quo. I'll help them get their thing made. Um, and that's, you know, Shelly May's doing that now. And uh, Brad Pitt's certainly done that. And DiCaprio's done that. That's just been DiCaprio's thing. But Cruz goes through the 90s doing that with people like Scorsese, with Paul Thomas Anderson, with Magnolia, stuff like that. And that works for him pretty much all the way until 2005. But let's take a step back. What do you guys know about Scientology? Got to go clear, baby. Got to go clear. I know there's this awesome sci-fi action movie <laughs> called Battlefield Earth. Battlefield <laughs> Base off Earth. A great novel by the founder of Scientology. I mean, you guys actually know the like the mythology behind or the I, like I've heard like, some of it before, but like, no, I don't remember. I I do, but I'm going to need the ball to get rolling a little bit for me to begin to Well, the basic tenets of theology which you don't learn this when you join Scientology. This is something that you have to achieve a certain level of going clear and all that stuff to learn. So Scientology does not want this stuff to come out. It only really began to come out in the internet age when people started leaving the church and started posting things. But eventually, once you've spent thousands of dollars and gone through many levels of Scientology, you will find out the basic story, which is that Zanu was the ruler of a galactic empire and he was, this was millions of years ago. He was about to be deposed. And what he needed to do in order to win the vote was to eliminate large swaths of the population. And so in order to do that, he did the most logical thing you can think of, which is he drugged and paralyzed a whole bunch of people and dropped them off on Tikagak, which was what planet Earth was called back then, and stacked them all in their paralyzed form near volcanoes. And then he did what you'd expect, which is... He blew up those volcanoes with hydrogen bombs <laughs> and all these paralyzed people, their bodies were de- or aliens, whatever they were, their bodies were destroyed, leaving only their ghosts, their spirits. So there are these immortal spirits of aliens that inhabit the earth to this day. They're called Phaetons and they inhabit our bodies and they cause us harm and cause us spiritual distress. So if you're depressed, if you have a disease of my acid reflux that I struggle with, all these things are Thetans, again, the spirits of aliens that were paralyzed and then blown up by the galactic ruler, Zeno. Pretty, pretty standard stuff. But what you have to do is you have to be cleared of the Thetans that are possessing you. And the way that you get cleared is you get audit, audited. And so the basic religious rite of Scientology is auditing, where I'll sit across the table from an audit, like Ben's my auditor and Ben will have me hooked up to a machine. I'll be holding two sort of tin can type things that will send an electrical pulse through my body. And Ben will be looking at this thing. It's called an electro psychometer or e-meter. And it'll have these, a little needle that'll be going back and forth showing how sort of possessed by Thetans I am. And what Ben is going to do is he's going to talk me through my childhood, my bad experiences, the things that I have. And he's going to keep, we're going to keep talking about it until I'm clear, until that Thetan has left my body. And Ben will be able to tell because he's got a little electrical meter that is going to tell him whether I've been cleared of whatever it was that session. And so I'm going to spend thousands of dollars and I'm going to go to thousands of these sessions and I'm going to begin these sessions before I even know the grand mythology behind it all. I'm only going to learn that, as I said, thousands of dollars and many sessions in once I've moved up levels. You're always moving up levels towards the bridge of total freedom, which you want to hit. But as you can imagine, it works. Like it's a, It actually works just fine yep. in terms of solving people's problems with their marriage or with depression. It's like you're talking to somebody and they're asking you questions. And anybody who does any kind of counseling knows that, what would you say, Jake, 80% of it is 
listening, asking questions, getting people to open up. Yeah, the, a lot of counseling is just make making people feel heard and understood, and then helping them interpret the things that have happened to them in the light of of what Scripture says about God and about sin and about and then helping them understand the responsibilities they have in light of the things that have been done to them and that they have done. Uh, right. Helping them understand their responses and deal with their habits and patterns and learn to walk in a way that's godly. And so there's all kinds of ways to, to take God out of the equation, but still be generally helpful to people because you've led them to a deeper understanding of themselves and a deeper understanding of the world and a deeper understanding of why they do what they do. And you've empowered them to break habits or especially self-destructive habits by helping them understand where it came from and how they got started. And you know, it's like it's a 12 step program. Yeah, they work right. well. They're based on Christian principles, but they just, God can be the chair. God can be whatever you want him to be. And they're going to leave you stranded at some point, yeah, no and matter you, what. Yeah, exactly. These things don't work ultimately, but you can get a lot of short term growth and some happiness out of it. So it's very easy to be excited about Scientology early on, which is how they get their And then you've invested a ton of time and money and you felt helped. Right. Exactly. And, and so you're in, and the deeper in that you are, the more embarrassing and difficult it is to admit how stupid it all. Well, and they are masters. I mean, they are they are just a cult. It's amazing that they've gotten this far, that they are a religious institution in the United States. They have nonprofit status, although people are always trying to take it away from them. But they have a clergy. Their clergy are called the Sea Org, the Sea Organization. And as you move up in the ranks and as you spend more money, you become, you gain power within the system. But it does everything that a classic cult does. Is, you know, it's very us versus them. You're taught to fear anyone who's not a Scientologist, fear, the, fear anyone who would dare criticize. You're separated from the real world. You're kept off of the internet. You're separated from your family if they can pull it off. You're always jumping through hoops of hierarchy, always trying to please an unappeasable leader. You're taught to self-recriminate. You're, there's a lot of public humiliation and stuff like that, which will tie into our story. And you're always looking up to your flawless and perfect leader, who used to be L. Ron Hubbard, who was a failed wacko sci-fi author who literally said anyone who wants to make a lot of money should start a religion. He died sometime in the mid-80s and was replaced by David Miscavige, who is the only person on planet Earth that seems like more of a psychopath and shorter than Tom Cruise. He's this empty, intense little dude. Have you guys ever seen like an interview or anything with David Miscavige? He's no. insanely like the evil leader of a cult. Um, several inches shorter than Tom Cruise. He is chairman of the board. And he was L. Ron Hubbard's aide and then fought for the top spot in the church after Hub Hubbard shed his earthly body, which was an intentional decision on Hubbard's part to go into a higher level of spiritual being. But David Miscavige became leader of the church and is Tom Cruise's best friend. So Tom Cruise joins Scientology when he is 24, and he claims that it helps him clear his dyslexia. His wife at the time, not Nicole Kidman, the one before that, I don't have her name written down. I forget what her name was, but she introduced him to it as soon as his sisters had joined as well. And there are absolutely wild stories of how Tom, of how Scientology has courted both John Travolta and Tom Cruise. One of the people that left Scientology was the guy who spent 32 years where his principal job was to act as the customizer, but behind all of Cruz's toys, like he would wire up his SUVs, his motorcycles, his private airplane, clean guns, help Tom Cruise with his skeet shooting stuff, maintain Tom Cruise's house in Beverly Hills, all for $50 a week and room and board as a member of the Sea Org clergy, working something like 80 hours a week. So Whoa. a slave, Tom Whoa. Cruise, Tom Cruise literally has or has had, we have Lots of people that have left the church and have attested to this. It's a known thing. Tom Cruise has had base, what amounts to white American slave labor, maintaining his properties, taking care of his cars, taking care of his airplanes, all this stuff for free. And it is insane. It is insane. The other thing that you should know about Scientology, because it ties into our story, is they have 
all these punishments. They have this place called The Hole, which is a series of guarded buildings where they send people. And there's stories about like a woman who was punished by being made to wear a black boiler suit to sign that no one was to talk to her. She had to sleep on the floor and she was assigned months and months of hard manual labor, like just pushing a wheelbarrow around. I mean, they're crazy. And I highly recommend the documentary Going Clear, which you can find on HBO Max if you happen to have that, if you want more information about. It's a really interesting story about Scientology. And I hate cult documentaries and I'm not like into that stuff. Like I I don't listen to the cultish podcast or anything like that. But I think this has such an intersection with our lives and Californian society and movie star. It's just, it's just interesting. So David Miscavige, the current leader of Scientology was best man at Tom Cruise's wedding to Dave, to Katie Holmes. He's been working to make Tom Cruise's life what it is and having his little slaves and minions do it since the early days. Tom Cruise in, what, I think Days of Thunder was 1990, Tom Cruise meets 22-year-old Nicole Kidman on the Days of Thunder set, and they are married for 10 years. I remember that being like the celebrity marriage when I was a kid. Like, uh. that was, everybody loved Tom and Nicole. But the Scientologists never liked Kidman. She tried to kind of give herself to it, but she never really got into it. And so David Miscavige determines that she's a suppressive person, which is what they call anyone on the outside of Scientology. And he goes to great lengths to drive her out of Tom Cruise's life. He taps their phone, supposedly. You've got Sea Org members constantly reporting on Kidman and Cruise's movements, all this kind of stuff. And after, the, after Tom finally divorces Nicole, their kids are immediately taken away to a Scientology habitat where they are taught, where they get a course in identifying suppressive persons. And they're taught that their mother is a suppressive person. Nicole Kidman still does not have a relationship with her oldest son or daughter. I forget which, because they just think she's an out. She's a suppressive person. She's not. Does Cruz have a relationship with them at all? Like I've never seen. Yes, he does. I mean, Cruz is so... He, he battened down the hatches for reasons that we'll get to. But after Cruz and Kidman divorce in the early 80s, Cruz is looking for a girl. He brings he dates Penelope Cruz, who's his co-star in Vanilla Sky in 2000. So it's Cruz and Cruz. That's like in all the tabloids at the time. But she does not want to forsake her Buddhism. She's a, so she becomes another suppressive person who is driven out of Tom Cruise's life. David Miscavige, who's always looking for ways to get his claws in Tom Cruise. The stories that they tell about David Miscavige is that he's just a nasty person, that he'll Re- Tom Cruise still gets audited, right? Like the tin can thing I was describing. So the story is that he'll read Tom Cruise's auditing reports out loud to his other minions while drinking scotch, that he's physically ass- assaulted people. He's been, people have tried to bring multiple human trafficking charges against him, stuff like that. Uh, Shelly McScavige, his wife, has not been seen and since 2007. All kinds of conspiracy theories about that. Every time the police go out and try to do something, they produce something that we're not privy to, but the police feel satisfied. Bye. So everybody on sort of right wing Twitter says she's been dead for years, but Scientology has their claws and the police force in the LAPD. And it's not unlikely, I don't think. But David Miscavige is like, all right, Tom Cruise lost Nicole, who was a suppressive person. He lost Penelope, who's a suppressive person. We got to find a new girl for him. And so he puts Shelly Miscavige, his wife, in charge, and they make these fake training videos for a top secret Scientology mission and they start getting beautiful young women to come in. This is all very well documented. And it's not supposedly to be Tom Cruise's girlfriend, but somewhere in this process, they will always ask like, so what do you think about Tom Cruise? And they've eventually narrow it down to a woman named Nazanin Boniade, a gorgeous, petite, Iranian-born woman in her mid-20s. Cruise was 42 at this time whose mother was also a Scientologist. She's the same type of glamorous brunette as Penelope Cruz. I'm quoting from a Vanity Fair article. She is shorter than Tom Cruise, of course. She graduated with honors in biological sciences from the University of California and had plans to go to medical school and was an accomplished violinist. She seemed perfect, but she had a boyfriend. And so they say, hey, Nazanin, you've been chosen for a secret Scientology mission. And... We're going to audit, audit you for a few months to make sure you're ready for it. So they audit her and they ask her all these questions about Tom Cruise, about her sex life. They want to make sure that she's like virginal enough, the, the right kind of woman for Tom Cruise, hasn't done certain things. They 
make her tell her like as part of your Scientology mission that we haven't even told you what the mission are. We need you to lose your braces. We need you to redo your hair. We need you to break up with your boyfriend. And she doesn't want to break up with the boyfriend. So they bring the boyfriend in. They audit the boyfriend. They get all his deep secrets. And then they share his auditing reports with his girlfriend. So she'll be disgusted with him and break up with him. Then they have her sign an NDA confidentiality agreement kind of thing for this top secret mission. They buy her clothes. They set her up. Finally, she has flown out to meet Tom Cruise, and she still doesn't even know what the mission is. But it turns out the mission is to go on a sushi and ice skating date with Tom Cruise. Sushi and ice skating being her dream first date, which she revealed in an auditing session. And Tom is there. He's ready. They go on this date and have a good time. And she's isolated from her parents. Like she's still on this top secret mission. So she can't talk to anyone. She's basically just like now Tom Cruise is in her world. But she falls in love. She falls in love with Tom Cruise. And every day she's getting audited by people who are keeping tabs on things, giving her tips. Like you need to be more flattering to Tom or Tom. Let's purge those negative thoughts, those thetans that still exist about Tom Cruise. Supposedly, Tom Cruise wanted her molars filed down, which they were. She's unable to speak to her parents, as I said. But as you can imagine, the relationship that has been set up this way does not actually last for very long, begins to fracture. On a snowmobile trip with Tom Cruise, she gets her period and falls off of a snowmobile and injures herself. Scientologists do not medicate because you can just clear everything with auditing. And so it's against the church to even take an aspirin or anything like that. So she's, she goes back to the ski lodge where our old friend David Miscavige is. And David Miscavige is actually a lot like Tom Cruise, just a less charismatic, more upfront evil kind of Tom. He's like a very fast talking, intense dude. English is not her first language. He's talking to her. He's talking to her. He's blah, 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 blah. She says, excuse me, excuse me. She can't understand what he's saying. And so... She manages to insult David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology. She gets called into Tom Cruise's office, and Tom Cruise gives her a dressing down that we can only imagine from those videos we were talking. He gives her like a whole, a full like Tom Cruise, how dare you treat David this way kind of thing. After this, Tom is distant. He doesn't want to talk to her. Eventually, she is advised by Scientologist minions to move out of his place. He does not give her the courtesy of even seeing her to break up with her. She's just removed from his life. And the word that gets back with her is to her is Tom wants someone who has her own power, someone like Nicole. She is sent to the hole to get counseling and to atone for her sins against the the church of Scientology. She is not allowed to mention the affair to anyone. She finally breaks down like a friend at the, this prison is like, why are you always crying? And she finally breaks down and tells this person, what happened? The person turns, or the friend turns around and promptly writes up a 10 page knowledge report on her. And then her two month punishment was to scrub toilets with a toothbrush on her hands and knees, clean bathroom tiles with acid, and dig dishes in the middle of the night. She's also harangued for hours and made to confess what a horrible human being she was. We do have a happy ending to her story because, believe it or not, she left the Church of Scientology soon thereafter and is now settled and happy and married to someone else. But that brings us to the part of the story that everyone knows, which is Tom Cruise moves from her to Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes was 26 to his 42. And she kind of comes under Tom Cruise's spell. She's become a Scientology. The saving grace of Katie Holmes's life is that Katie Holmes' father, Martin Holmes, is a divorce lawyer. And he sees what happens. And he's like, Katie Holmes is falling in love with Tom Cruise. And I'm a really smart, savvy lawyer. So I am going to, fine, I can't stop you, daughter, but I'm going to write the mother of all prenups. And so he wrote a prenup that took up five bankers' boxes and enabled their divorce, their eventual divorce, which didn't take long to happen, to, to take place in about 11 days, which is amazing for a celebrity divorce with all that at stake. So Katie Holmes still has her children, and they don't talk to Tom Cruise, but we can thank her Katie Holmes' dad, who is a very savvy dude for getting ahead of the evil of the Church of Scientology. But I know we talked about this on the podcast before. Somewhere around here, 
in 2005, Tom Cruise is having a good run. He's with Spielberg. They've done Minority Report, War of the Worlds. I think it's on the War of the Worlds tour. He is the first person to just get sort of canceled or destroyed by internet culture, which, which just wasn't a thing that he could even anticipate. But he does this thing where he's really excited about Katie Holmes and he jumps up and down on Oprah's couch and it passes in like a moment. It's not, if you actually go back and watch the video, it's not that interesting, but the internet latches onto it. The internet slows it down, adds like glowing Palpatine lightning to it. It makes, it's like one of the first big memes of that era of the internet. And it's sort of, it's like the boy pointing out the emperor has no clothes. It's like the whole internet just suddenly realized, oh, this guy's always been kind of crazy. And now we're just going to make fun of it. And so they pile on. All the gossip blogs start publishing things about Scientology. Cruz gives, gives these disastrous interviews where he goes after Brooke Shields for having psychiatric problems and says people should never see psychologists or take psychiatric medication. And so his brand really, really begins to suffer. And Tom Cruise then does something amazing. He battens down the hatches. He stops giving interviews. He begins to control his image. And somehow rehabs it entirely. He rehabs it entirely to the fact that people, nobody even talks about this stuff. I mean, there's still some cranks that we'll talk about. Well, he had a lot of help from Bob Iger and Kathleen Kennedy and a lot of other people. I don't, I think you're right. I think that these movies don't deserve to hit the way that they hit. But man, the context. Yeah, the context mm -hmm. is just like it's an yeah. arid desert and it's this a, is the oasis. It's an arid yeah. desert of we hate you. We hate everything about you and we don't want you to have fun. And the things that you think should be fun are going to be not fun. And they're going to be, even the things that are going to feel fun are going to have a mean spirited edge about them. And so it's just like a nasty, nasty environment for movies. And that's an opportunity for somebody. And he's got the money and the resources and the talent and the drive and the ambition to actually step into that space and make something that, Anybody can look at his life and say, you are a monster, mm -hmm. but... A more well-documented monster than all kinds of people that we could name that we don't like or have been canceled. Mm -hmm. or... and, and yet, in this world of entertainment, you're like the only person who feels like he doesn't hate me. Yeah, I mean, I think... What or he wants to make something that I can enjoy. I think it's... He has real fear. I mean, I think he has real skeletons. He understands that the audience almost turned on him and destroyed him. It's like in a weird way, Tom Cruise is more well motivated by fear and by just like Tom Cruise knows that things could go wrong. Where Kathleen Kennedy or somebody like that or Iger just has this arrogance of, well, I've always made a billion dollars and worked in a billion dollar and I am on my yacht. It's like Tom Cruise actually did almost lose everything, which has made him actually be smarter and have more respect for the audience. And it's made him just like shut down and like my movies are not going to be about anything. I'm not going to give myself to And so far anybody. as they're about anything, they're about things that feel universal. Right. Oh no, the internet age is scary. AI is scary. AI is scary. Shadow organizations are scary. Yeah. It's like Wouldn't it be nice to feel like you had a friend who would never let you down and who would always be there to save you? Right. That's just all that Christopher Reeve ever said was behind his Superman. Everybody just wishes they had a friend. The world feels really nasty and hostile. And what Superman actually is just a friend, but a really powerful one that you feel like would stop and get your cat out of a tree because he could do that sort of thing. Right. And that's all Ethan Hunt is trying to do as a character. He's just trying to be the guy who is fiercely loyal to his friends and is always going to try to do the right thing and is going to put everybody else ahead of himself. He's going to be the first to die and he's always going to save the day. And you can depend on him to come through. And that's that's it. That's the full extent of his character. And we're not going to be too self-deprecating about that. We're not going to go through lots of angst about that. That's just that's exactly what we do. I mean, Tom Cruise has really not made a picture with a great collaborator since those days, he stopped working with Scorsese. And I mean, he's everything is so tightly controlled about his image. No, those people are going to take risks and he's not going to take any risks. He's, he's got a, he's found his workman. His name's Christopher McQuarrie. He's a guy who's realized that he can't make good movies himself, but what he can do is help other people realize their vision. 
And that's the way that he talks about the movies that he makes. He's like, I, I'm not good at having my own vision, but I'm really good at helping other people realize their own vision. And that's all I want to do. And so they collaborate because that's exactly what Tom Cruise wants. He just wants somebody who can make his vision come to life. Closest thing you have to a risk after that, the couch stuff would be, I mean, it's not a risk, but Valkyrie or something. Yeah. It's not really a risk. But. Yeah. I mean, I think Tom Cruise clung on to the dream of still doing some prestige projects after that. But at a certain point, he's just like, there is one thing that people want from me. And that is for me to be a fast running action man. And so I'm going to try and give them as much of that as possible. And I think he, he does have a risk that is coming up, which is his musical, which is based on his Tropic Thunder character, right? I don't know actually what the conceit is. I just know that he has, it's been public that there is a, and he's claimed he's working on a musical. Right. right. With Christopher McQuarrie. Of course. So it's his, it's his team. He was in that Rock of Ages musical. So I, mean, it's, it would be I, a, I went and watched. He was an American Maid, which never heard of, but that looks like more of a. Yeah, that is a movie that people like, I think. Looks like it. I've never heard of it. I remember it vaguely. That's Doug Lyman, another yep. kind of studio. Although a little more auteurish yeah. in his way. But and, the, so Cruz did Edge of Tomorrow with Doug Lyman. Yes, yes. So Cruz has got a couple guys. I mean, he has, I forget the guy that named did Maverick, Joe Krasinski or Kru, something. Yeah, like, Krasinski. Like that. But I think McCory's probably executive produced or produced all those things and had a hand in them. I mean, Tom Cruise has a production company. He has a team. He has managers. Uh, you are not allowed to ask him about any of the stuff I just mentioned in, in press tours now. He is tightly controlling of his public image in a way that is unusual, even in the Chris Pat, Ryan Reynolds, Will Smith. I mean, he is like, uh. he is micromanages his image. I mean, he has completely battened down the hatches. There is just, I'm going to make these formula pictures. I'm going to sell them like the world's greatest used car car salesman i'm gonna micromanage my public image and i'm just gonna keep doing it i'm gonna keep not commenting and eventually people will enjoy my product and they will forget and not care and he's absolutely right i mean it is the best success story in terms of somebody coming back from whatever you want to call it cancellation or whatever it's the kind of thing that louis ck or kevin spacey or one of those guys dreams of doing in terms of but those guys never had the capital to spend that he did in terms of actually staging his comeback like like nobody really cares if louis ck comes back and but that's right tom cruise has an entire industry and i think covid really really helped him because top gun hit at the right time he was able to embrace this role as cinema's savior and so he's kind of back in the graces of like hollywood yeah all he, relaxed. He, he was remaking top gun right when everybody was like when the woke mob was like it is now time to triple down and push everything to the edge of what can be tolerated. Right. The very edge of what middle America can take and beyond. And they push it over now. They're reaping the whirlwind. Tom Cruise, meanwhile, is doing quite well. Yep. Because he... And he's not going to stop doing well. Like, everybody's just going to be on the train because there ain't nothing else out there. And I'm not trying to take it away from anyone. If you're like the kind of person who has a super sensitive conscience and your conscience and you're like, Oh, you didn't, why'd you tell me Tom Cruise was such a monster? Well, they're all monsters. Like they're all monsters. <laughs> if you watch any movies, then you've watched somebody who's a rapist or at least a fornicator or a, like, these are terrible people. Tom Cruise is just a very well documented, terrible person who happened to work for an organization that was able to provide slightly more upfront slave labor and uh, concubines than <laughs> your average star who works for slightly more reputable organizations that can provide slightly more reputable slave labor and concubines. So Tom Cruise, I mean, Scientology is terrible and it's ridiculous that there's an entire culture, subculture of Hollywood entertainers that give themselves to this stupid, stupid thing. But they've done a good job of marketing themselves and of before the internet, I think that it was their golden age because the stuff about Zanu, like all the stuff that's just, self-evidently insane just didn't come out like nobody really knew what scientology was they just knew it was kind of a goofy hippie thing that Cruz and travolta gave themselves to but battlefield earth famously got out of their control and didn't do them any favors either the turkey of a movie that the uh, uh, john travolta right 
tried to do. So I'm not trying to take Tom Cruise away from anybody. I just thought that it was a very interesting story. He's an interesting guy, endlessly fat, fascinating. And I like a star with a little mystery. Like we don't get that anymore. People are so their the brand is accessibility so much. And so it's like, here's my home life. Here's my what and it's all fake, but you're supposed to feel like Chris Pratt. I think what's much more interesting is a guy like Jack Nicholson, where you're like, I don't know what Jack Nicholson's. I mean, I know he's like a crazy devilish prankster kind of joker Jack. I, I know his brand, but I don't necessarily know what it would be like to hang out with him or Brando or one of those gold stars or who are Cary Grant. It's like, what is going on in Cary Grant's head and heart underneath everything? None of your business. None of your business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. And he's not going to come on a bunch of talk shows. And- come see my movie because I'm in it and... That's it. That's my exchange. You give me money, I give you entertainment for two hours every once a year and give you some memories. Great. I think that's a cool way for a star. So let me, everything's so self-revelatory and neurotic these days. It's kind of fun to have a star. Not that anything about Tom Cruise is good, but just anyone who doesn't reveal, anyone that we can sit here and speculate about because they haven't told us everything has a level of intrigue and mystery and fun to them. If you were in Hollywood, would you want to work on a film with Tom Cruise? Sure. Here's the exchange. I'm going to make you a ton of money and people are going to love what we do and they're going to feel really good about you. Like whatever you have to bring to the table, you don't have to bring a lot. We're just going to make you look good. We're going to make you look fun or interesting. You can be Henry Cavill and people are going to say, well, this might be your coolest moment, even though you played Superman. You can be, what's his face? The little Scottish... Uh, Simon Pegg? Simon Pegg. You can be Simon Pegg and be beloved in all kinds of fun little properties, but people are going to, like, there's going to be a generation of people that think of you as Benji, Mm -hmm. and they're going to love you in that role as much as they love or hate you in other roles. Yeah, no, and you'll be- You're going to be the villain, and people are going to think- that was kind of a cool, fun villain role. The reason you don't do it is because you don't, because you want your own self-expression, which is fair enough. Or because you don't want to be just a stepping stone for the great man's greatness, which right. which is also fair enough. I think Tom Cruise is interesting. He doles out good roles. Like everybody in Top Gun has some stuff to do. It's a good showcase for Miles Teller and Val Kilmer and some of the others. And same thing with Benji and Luther. But there also is a sense in which you're never allowed to surpass the man. You're never allowed to surpass the man. And that, it, well, the, and Maverick uh, is the ultimate example. Maverick is hilarious. Yeah, the whole plot is is geared towards a a trade-off, handing the torch, and then the torch can't be handed. It can't possibly be handed off. Like, he can't die. He can't be surpassed. He can't be superseded. (laughs) It is not to be done. That's not the world that we live in. We live in Tom Cruise's world. Right. And so even though the good movie is the one where he dies and Miles Teller takes the franchise forward, no way, dude. No, I mean, it's, it's not even about time. My, at the very least, Miles Teller should be the one getting the girl. But no, it's Tom Cruise getting the girl. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Dead-eyed Jennifer Connelly. Oh, man. Who I liked, actually, in that movie, unlike you guys. Did not. Well, what else do you guys have to say about this movie? What is your... Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. A new fantastic point of view. Good as a point of view, anyway. But a point of view on this film. It was a fun time at the movies. We, I could not believe, but of course I could, that we had to have another gratuitous trading of brunettes. <laughs> Although, <laughs> Haley Atwell, actually two years older than Rebecca Ferguson. Yes. But she doesn't look it. Yeah, exactly. We upgraded again. It was another. It was another upgrade. You feel like you're getting a and younger, so, sexier, curvier model. You're getting what you are getting is somebody who can age up better with Tom Cruise, and so he's done this weird thing where it's like he he knows better than to have the twenty something, but he's he, gonna find a very yeah forty something who's full of vitality. Shall yeah, we say. that forty something that he picks is gonna be somebody who ages really well. Well, I mean, the funny thing is he could still be with Michelle Monaghan and we could still yeah. say that, but instead he kicked her to the curb and, you know, he wanted something even better and then he wanted something better than that. But Michelle Monaghan's perfectly attractive 50-year-old. They're, they're older, all actually just fine. Yeah. They're all actually beautiful women into their 40s and 50s yeah. and <laughs> would have been just fine. So it's just really gratuitous, <clears throat> the trade. 
I agree, but I also think that Haley Atwell was one of the best things about the movie. I really liked her. Yeah, uh, me too. She's a nice actress. <laughs> she's terrible in Captain America. I hate her. As well, that's because her character yeah, is she's, stupid. She's just a play brittle. And... I didn't even I didn't but, even realize that's who it was. Yeah, well, she, that's how good a job that she did. Like, she just yep. did not feel like Peggy Carter or anything yeah, like that. No. And then it's a tribute to how, what she actually brings to the table if you're going to use her. Well, she's a little more vulnerable and feminine than Rebecca Ferguson got to play. Well, you have the... I love that stupid Fiat chase. Oh, yeah. yeah the great. Fiat chase was great. Super fun. It feels like that. It did a ton oh of well, work. Can we just put it up, a ton of make work. the obvious comparison? Tuck, tuck, chase. Fiat chase. Oh, my So goodness. many Indiana Jones comparisons. Yeah. You have a big train scene. Right. Well, and that's the stupid thing. Like, you got an Indiana Jones movie. You're going to have a train scene. Again, you can't do an Indiana Jones movie and put in a train scene without trying to make the best train scene that ever happened. Mm-hmm. Well, Mission Impossible's already got a really great train scene, and it's got a couple, maybe? Maybe. But every time, it's going to try to one-up itself. And so, like, yeah. greatest train sequence of all time, mm-hmm. right? Mission Impossible's going to go for it every single time. Cruz is never going to make the mistake of not going for it. Meanwhile, Indiana Jones doesn't even try to be Doesn't that, try to do anything. Like, not anything. That Fiat scene, I had, I just really loved, I loved, I laughed out loud when we zoomed out on her just spinning it in circles. That was fun. But compare it to, <laughs> I like the comparison you were making, but you have gr- grumpy old actor who should be well past his prime with a cute, spunky girl who's kind of antagonistic sort of a brat sort sort of a brat in a car being pursued by overpowered everyone like at least two other parties in this kit both indiana jones and mission impossible you think about everything that the indiana jones tuck tuck chase does to make it unrealistic to make it not fun to make phoebe waller bridge annoying and then you think about how charming Haley atwell is doing exactly the same kind of character type and positioned in the story the same way kind of leaving him handcuffed like she's doing the same like stuff same kind of bratty stuff Mm -hmm. but but it plays differently because she just has a little bit of vulnerability as a character um and it's not nathan the misogynist saying every woman has to be vulnerable it's nathan the women can't drive is that what you're saying nathan and that was the joke is that women can't drive no i'm saying characters should have vulnerabilities it makes us like them because we have vulnerabilities and yes it is nice to see a female character who has some extra vulnerability because that gives our because a that's the way god made the world and b it gives our hero something to do, and That's it gives right. him. It allows him to be stronger, which is a great fast fantasy for us as guys, and a great fantasy for girls. Like, wouldn't it be fun to be? And with it allows the hero? her to still have her places where she can have the upper hand over on him, which she does. She but it's because she's him. thinking. Yep. It's because she's. It's not just because she's a super powered woman who can do everything. It's because she outsmarts him, or she gets the best. Like, While he is busy doing the thing that she can't do, mm-hmm. which is get them out of the mess while driving the car with one hand while they're handcuffed, she is plotting the next step. Yep. And right. gives you a nice little surprise where, you know, and you don't feel bad about it. It's like, what else? Was he supposed to be watching her uncuff herself while he was trying to one hand steer this car while being chased? And it, yeah, it was, it was like, you don't feel bad about any of it. It has like some woke. Ta- it's like you have to pay taxes. It yeah. has some taxes. Like she, Gabriel should have been able to bust up in the knife fight with her, but instead he doesn't right. because feminism. It's going to take at least thirty seconds. It's, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, I mean, he's going to. He, he's but able to kill Rebecca Ferguson. It, you know, they do. I mean, they downplay it, and that was even that was nice. Even that felt like a quite a relief. But you me. just compare like she's there's a train going over a cliff at the end. Hey, there's a character who's actually allowed to be scared of falling into a gorge on a train. Like Phoebe Waller Bridge could never just give us like the obviously Indiana Jones can't be scared. He's Indiana Jones, but Phoebe He's been through this a thousand times. But Phoebe Waller Bridge is there in the right in a well written movie and well performed movie to be the character that experiences what I would experience. And gives your main character, your lead, all the more reason to project strength. Right, because now he's not just like being the awesome badass superhero. He's got to project strength for her. Because if he doesn't project strength for her, she's not going to have the courage to get through things. Right, he's got to actually be able, whether he believes it or not. So it brings an extra layer even to the character moment that your lead is. No, Ethan has no vulnerabilities. That's not the point. Mm -hmm. But just the possibility 
introducing the possibility that he's putting on a face for her does add a little layer to the drama. Yeah. Even in a movie like this one. And, you know, it's fun to fantasize about being a guy and being strong enough. And it's fun to fantasize about being a girl and having, you know, a man that's strong. It's like these tap into basic human desires and emotions and things. And, and they do remember, it. They remember do when it, movies used to do that? Like they do just, it during yeah, the action scenes. when they, like, scenes. believed in sexuality. Right. <laughs> they do it during the action scenes, which movies don't do anymore. Oh, man. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really even mind Pom Clementoff. She felt like an old school. I mean... Understand, this whole conversation is we're in a desert and it's nice to find an that's, oasis. That's right. So she yeah, has yeah, to, yeah, we yeah, have yeah, to have yeah. a superpowered female lead to be a contrast, or not lead, but a, f- a superpowered female mm-hmm. villain to be mm-hmm. a yeah. contrast to our vulnerable heroine. Just to remind us that, but at the same time, so, so well, all that's of this. A, that's a but, straight hat tip to right. wokeness. So, like, so there's this no movie, question yeah, it's, yeah, it's, of course. It's terrible. Like, you know, you, uh, I was at the gym not too long ago, and I happened to notice for just a second that a girl that was wearing a mini skirt, and I was like, "Wow, modesty!" I didn't say that out loud. Uh-huh. Now, of course, nothing about anything about this girl was modest, but just compared to everything else that happens at the, so that's that's all we're saying about this. Like it was, yeah, it was refreshing that it even nodded its head towards a little bit of truth, and it's gonna <laughs> nod its head even in the way that it lets the villainous be vulnerable and sad and like feel cared for. Yeah, well, she's gonna make the exchange from the bad patriarch to the good patriarch. Right. Right. Which is right. something that James Bond girls used to do every movie. Yep. But we just can't have basic beats like that. Also, Ethan Hunt doesn't just bash her head. Un- unlike our little uh, I know. short round uh, Teddy. Fake, fake Teddy handcuffing a guy under the water to drown. Ethan Hunt doesn't bash her head. And there's, yeah. there's no moment in the here where you feel like, oh, Ethan's being so cruel or like, like always in these modern action Based. movies. Yeah, there, it's just always like, we're not like your grandpa's action movie. We actually kill people. There's always that scene. All the Marvel movies, even the nicest, even like an Iron Man or something has that. And and it's just... Yeah, well, Tony is going to be the one who, you know, just over, does the over-the-shoulder kill or does the no-look mm-hmm. blast the bad guy as he starts to get up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or just throws the bad the guy to the villagers and says, have at him, boys. And it's like, I don't actually, I'm tired of that. Maybe it felt refreshing back when Dirty Harry was doing it 50 years ago to have a hero that was as amoral or as whatever. And it wasn't just John Wayne, but. A hero with a code, any kind of code, a code of any kind. Well, and here's an idea, maybe a heroic one. Yeah. But maybe even a heroic one. Uh, I like codes and John Wick has a code, but it's like an assassin's code. Maybe a hero that's actually fighting for good likes his friends. So now I'm doing it. I, like, I'm just, I'm excited that this movie is like feeding me a cheeseburger because everybody else is feel, feeding me sand and glass and stuff like that. Like it is really refreshing to just have a movie that does some basic stuff like that. So what else is there to say? Action seeds are great. In terms of being unapologetically self-aggrandizing, I do think that it is 100% hilarious that the conceit of the movie is that the AI, the entity, is afraid of exactly one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. It is Ethan Hunt. There is exactly one person, one thing on this entire planet capable. God versus Ethan Hunt, basically. It is basically, yeah, it is yeah. basically God versus Ethan Hunt. E- Ethan Hunt is the one threat to... Total godhood. I will say, and it takes it, it. It's actually it's funny. It's bad because one of the fun things about it takes that little bit of edge out. That little bit of it. No, a Mission Impossible movie should really feel impossible. Mm-hmm. It should feel impossible until the very end when he has your up. Oh, I had the upper hand all along. Right. Moment. Let me take off my mask. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the fun of the movies. You can't take that away mm-hmm. from them. Like, that's just part of it, right? Like, that's one of the only interesting things that they do is is mm-hmm. how how did Ethan always have the upper hand? But so to have that be peppered in in really explicit, ham-fisted ways, I thought was the literal only lame thing about this movie. There's nothing else lame about it at all. Well, I mean, I thought, else was perfection. Uh, so, but, the, yeah, these movies always... I'm not going to say they've had one foot in reality. I think they've had a toe, though, maybe, like one one out of ten toes. 
nine nine toes pure fantasy one toe gesturing towards some kind of socio-political real this movie is such a ridiculous he's fighting skynet the girl is like a such a movie character like the the thief that can do crazy sleight of hand thing like that character has never existed i'm sorry teenage boys the sexy thief that is it's like if Catherine Zeta Jones was playing that old canard in that stupid movie with Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like never before. There is no precedent for this in real life. You know, there's never been a sexy. I'm sorry. Now people send me articles about sexy female double, thieves. Double jeopardy. Double jeopardy. Yeah. It's like You're welcome. There, there is nothing. This movie has no toe in the water of reality uh-huh. or of. I found that a little bit disappointing, I guess. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I could I would have taken a more down to earth villain gabriel just with a gabriel plan instead of supercomputer i'm not i don't personally feel threatened by ai i love ai i I love chat gtv i think that stuff's all great and exciting so i just i do not feel any angst about any of it that people seem that this movie's trying to tap into no i don't think so i don't don't feel it either i like the playground that it creates maybe they'll do even more in the next movie with analog stuff and have some fun gags yeah yeah i mean i think that's a fun conceit for all of those reasons, like they got to use radio waves, got to use some other things. Yeah, that's fun. But let's get there without that, Skynet, though. Yeah, well, they even cheated. It's like Luther's just going to be hacking different satellites at the AI. Right. I think it's just like he could have done some much more fun things. I'm waiting to see what the fun things are. It's more like you had a, the minute you went the direction of AI, you had a thousand problems you had to solve. And so you just cheated. Instead, you cheated. You created shortcuts yeah. instead of finding the real creative solutions. Because again, all your creativity is going into your action set pieces and nothing else matters. You just start stitching together action set pieces and your connective tissue is going to be a different action set piece unless it's people standing around in a room with an empty table at the center of it. Yeah, well, that, right? that is my other major criticism, even more so than the other movies. I would say this one is so... When you think about the relative wit of like a Spielberg exposition dump and then you think about the Carrie Elways scene that opens up this movie... <laughs> Where it's just like, how were you describing it yesterday, Ben? When we were, I don't remember what I said, uh, but it's just like it's like mannequins one after the other. Like, yeah, I'll say a sentence, and then you say a sentence, and let's keep going around the room until we've all said two or three sentences. So, uh, as, as screenwriters, we started was, with the, the complete amazing. description of the exposition that we needed, and then we were like, Carrie always is going to say this much, and then that guy's going to take the ball, he's going to run with it, and then Carrie always will say back to him. Wait, so you're saying that the audience needs to understand <laughs> this plot point? And then the guy's like, yes, but it's even more serious because there's this plot point. And then the third guy. It was funny. It was the most latent. It's very cheeky. Been. I think it's some of it's kind of intentionally like, hey, guys, we all know nobody cares about this, right? Yeah, I think that there's like a very, there's a wink. There yeah. is, but also good scenes would have been nice, too. <laughs> And it did this weird thing. You guys didn't seem to care about that. Or when I asked you guys about this, it didn't seem like you'd really picked up on it. So maybe it was, I was just being extra whatever. But I did this weird thing that movies don't usually do. Usually if you're going to cut from a close-up of Nathan, you cut to a close-up of Jake or you cut to something else. That's just like one of the rules of film grammar. But this would do this thing where we have a close-up of Nathan and then we're going to cut not to a wide shot of Nathan, but just to a slightly different close-up of Nathan yeah. just to kind of jazz up and give some energy, I guess, ostensibly at least to some of these exposition scenes. <laughs> once but... you, once you said that, I realized that I'd noticed it in the film a couple of times and then wondered if I had, it's very strange. If what it feels like to me is, Oh crap, we didn't get what we wanted out of this scene or we didn't get the performance or we don't quite have the footage that's all shot. And so we're, I mean, I've done this a thousand times in creative projects of my own. Every movie has these things, but you always try to cover your tracks. It's like, I don't have what I want. And so I'm going to try to make it feel like I always was going to do a stylistic thing here. Like it's something that comes out of necessity. You try to disguise as a style choice, a style choice. And then this had that feeling to me, like uh, there's no reason we would actually want to cut it together like this, except for that we weren't all in the same room when we shot it. We didn't get the right reaction shots. COVID messed up our schedule, whatever. But I don't know. Maybe it was just a choice. If so, it was a, bad one i think it was kind of it added to the goofiness of all those exposition scenes well it is part it it, one way or another it feeds into a certain sort of tonal quality that ends up being refreshing which is as opposed to certain other installments of mission impossible and a ton of other movies there's nothing really self-serious about this yes 
And so it's like, yeah, we're not making stylistic statements. We're not, we're not taking ourselves too seriously here. We know what you came for and we're putting everything we got into that. And then you want other things, so you go to other movies. And yeah, it, would it be great if they put the same level of elbow grease into a screenplay, into a script, into... Or not the same, just some. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> but but I do think it is nice that they're not pretending. Like, Yeah, I mean, I wish they'd drop the act a little bit even more. I wish that they'd cut 20 minutes out of this. It's too long. I wish that, I mean, no such thing as too much ice cream, right? But also there is such thing as too much ice cream. I wish that, it seems like part of the brand of this type of movie and of this franchise is a little bit of brooding. So they make sure to include it. Like, here's the sad shot of them on the roof, just like looking at Venice. And it's like, things are scary. That was weird. That was a really weird thing. That made, that shot made so little sense to me. It's an you inter- mean it's, with him and Rebecca Ferguson? Yes. Well, I think they they, just uh, like, like they're in the room together, and then just we randomly cut to them. No, I, I think I know exactly what they did. I, I to, to, be, to me, I that thought. feels like it feels like actually we have to one. establish some emotional yeah, stakes it, between these two characters before we kill her. Yeah, I understand uh, that too. But no, it feels like we forgot and we did a pickup. That's exactly it, it feels, right. It feels like what I was saying about those close-ups. It uh. feels like. Oh, Rebecca Ferguson wasn't actually in this enough. We were expecting people to carry over more sort of feelings for her. So let's add a scene and let's just do it simply and quick. But and then just and then we can put it in the find trailers. a place to insert it. Yeah, yeah. I mean it. Yeah. So I could have done with a little less brooding. The brooding interludes seem to just be part of the brand at this point, and I wish they weren't. Like I, I wish Ethan Hunt as a character was having more fun. It's nice when he is, like in, when in the car chase, when it's kind of just quippy and fun, but. You know, with him like, I'm going to kill you. And oh, everything. he has a lot of fun in the airport. Yeah, the airport. Those are my <laughs> favorite scenes for that reason. Or even him parachuting down. Any Anytime Ethan Hunt is just trading quips over the headpiece with Benji or something like that. I like that kind of stuff more than when it's... I mean, one thing they do know is that if Benji is guiding Ethan around. Ethan's sort of in his hands and at a loss and Benji doesn't quite know and is always bluffing and... Up to the top of the mountain. Oh, no. Yep. Yeah, that's all fun. That was good. Yeah. And then Ving Rhames. And it's it, and it is, it's a good choice that he, oh, he it's, he's never angry with those guys. He's always just, okay, I guess I got a problem solve this now. Like, Yeah, I mean, it, know, Tom Cruise doesn't have that. He's put right. out, but he's not, like, he doesn't have an edge about it. Right. Everybody knows what Tom Cruise anger looks like. I've described it several times in this podcast. It would You would not feel good if he unleashed anything like that on poor Benji as an audience. And I think he's well aware of that. Gabriel was pretty good. Just trying to think of other thoughts. I could do without that white widow lady. She's pretty, she's like, I don't know. I didn't like her in the other movie. She's just a, another lame, weird movie character that. I liked her better in the other movie for some reason, for right or wrong. She had a little more to do. Yeah, well, she had a part to play. Yeah. I just feel like they're going so John Wick in terms of the universe. I just prefer a slightly more ground. I understand that none of this is grounded. None of it has anything to do with real spycraft. I get that, listener. But I prefer for it to feel a little bit more like it's not just, it's the most beautiful woman in the world, and she happens to be the most important arms dealer. You know, like, <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> And she's in a, a art installation with naked body paint people. And that was the unfortunate thing that Jake mentioned, by the way, folks. Yeah, those be, five, five, be and, five and six didn't have anything like that. Anything like that. Like they they had had some stuff like that in some of the earlier ones and they cut it out, made it a five and six and made it a little bit more kid friendly. So I, I, I wanted this to be more like that. And they threw that stupid... It's bad. Even that, I would say, though, does feel like Tom Cruise having a old fashioned sensibility. Like, yeah, I think actually what people like is a little sex appeal. So let's the uh, Disney's totally neutered that we don't do that in our movies anymore. Let's put that back in. We'll make sure there's a little bit for mom, a little bit for dad. Again, not defending it. I just think it's part and parcel of all the other decisions. All that he's trying to do. All that he's trying to do. We're not going to make Ferguson. Let's or, give a scene that the teenage boys can pause on. Right. Exactly. All the teenage boys have phones. Right. And let's not, we won't make Haley Atwell do it because, you know, we're too sort of progressive for that these days, even though that's what the teenage boys would really like. But he, he knows how to sort of straddle all kinds of lines. He's a smart guy. Smart production. 
anything else to say about this movie? I did like spoiler alert. I did like the Carrie Elway's death scene. I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> Where the guy's like, does anyone else know about this thing? <laughs> this top secret piece of information you're giving me? And Carrie Elves was like, no, ha ha, it'll die with me, buddy. <laughs> so you got to preserve my life. Unless the one thing you want is to destroy this information. In which case, I'm a dead man. Ha. Yep. Uh, I like Jay Wiggum. I liked the little meta conversation they had. he had with his buddy that was pursuing where they were i thought that was fun that was fun the whole like uh, is it possible that ethan's gone rogue nine thousand times and every time he's been right <laughs> yes <laughs> nice bit of criticism for daniel craig's run as james bond is, is like oh man how about we don't not need these guys always going rogue how about a movie where they just accept a mission and then do the mission Next best thing. Uh, next best we thing. We just make fun of it. We just make fun of it. <laughs> stupid trope that needs to die at this point. Not everything has to be James Bourne or James Bourne. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not everything has to be James Bourne. 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 James, James Bourne. Bourne. James Bourne. <laughs> what's, what's your drink of choice? <laughs> <laughs> A frosty. <laughs> Jake, any other thoughts? <laughs> With some Bacardi. <laughs> Bacardi. Oh, man. I mean... I don't, I think I've said them all. I, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about part two. It's going to be another fun time at the movies where we'll rehash this conversation. Yep. Because yep. Tom Cruise will be, again, a little bit of water in the desert. Yep. And I can't imagine anybody else stepping in. I'll say one other thing. There is a level at which if people like to throw around the word cinema or whatever. But there's a level at which I actually am excited about the process of making movies that I come away from a Mission Impossible film feeling that makes me, that does make me feel like I've watched or I've gotten the closest thing to a hit of Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And it's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not story, it's not plot, it's not character, but it is just the cinema. It is the cinematic construction of a visual experience. I agree. And that is something that Macquarie does well and that they do really well in those action scenes as a team. That it's just like, it's something that Brad Bird is a master at. It's something that there are guys that just understand. Guy Ritchie. Yeah, Guy Ritchie. Just understand visual storytelling in sequence with shots and camera work and setups and payoffs and how to construct an action sequence. That feels like a thrill or... That just gives you a feeling. It gives you any kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. And so there is like just a little, like I don't want to say that this is a great movie. I don't want to say it's a great, fully great cinematic experience, but there is an element of understanding the power and potency of the medium that is really fun and cool and beautiful and exciting. And that made Ian, like when we got out, we have to watch Tintin. I want to watch Tintin. I need you to see, Dad, the way that movie is built and the way that those action sequences are built and constructed and shot and how it all works. Like, I don't think you give that movie enough credit for being a really fun comedic action movie. This is like him talking to me. Mm -hmm. But that's what he was excited about. Like, mm -hmm. It sparked his imagination. And I think that, and mine too, I... So yeah, that's it. I think art, not to be horribly pretentious, but you like to feel like the artist worked on the art. I mean, just simply right. seeing an old Renaissance painting or something and realizing he had to draw every one of those figures in the background. He This took him years. He had to envision and, and imagine the figures in the background before he drew them. Yeah, there, there's an excitement. He had to place that, them there. And so it could be Brad Bird doing it all in CGI. It could be Tintin. I mean, Tintin is an interesting counterpoint because it is all CGI, but it's like it, you, you see Spielberg's craftsmanship. You see the thought. You see you feel his mind working, and there is just something intrinsically exciting about that. I think my placeholder for everything that Ian said in this movie is just that shot of Tom Cruise running across the – Yeah. Because it's great. like somebody had to think of that. Somebody had to 
composed that, that they were in a real airport and that Tom Cruise, and it's not an anti-CGI thing. Like I just said, you can use CGI to communicate artistic, to do something like this. But in this particular case, what's exciting is we had to think of it. We had to find the location. We had to stage it. Tom Cruise had, had to, to time hit it. his mark. The guy had to say the line. We had to get the, t- the comedic timing right, the action mm-hmm. timing right. And then it was part of a larger sequence that's built out of moments like that. And it's exciting. And mm, like a, you then- It's get, a real craft right. to and, that. And then you compare it like a Russo Brothers Marvel movie. And it's like uh, the actors probably ran around it. What you, whether it's true or not, because you know a ton of time and energy and craft goes into those things. But what it feels like is we had a bunch of really expensive stars run around on a green screen with some blue dots painted on their face going pew, 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 pew. And then we handed it over to a bunch of animators and they just like did stuff. Like colored you, it in. Colored it in. You don't you don't have that feeling or you rarely do. Minus with like a gun or, you know, there's exceptions. But oftentimes you just don't feel like there's thought that went into this. There's construction that went into this. And you it is it's what I like about you can make fun of him all you want for being too sincere or too hokey or writing people like the way that he thinks smart people should sound. But it's what I like about an Aaron Sorkin screenplay. It sounds like Aaron Sorkin revised this and want you know that work went into it. He wanted to build a scene. He wanted to have people ping-ponging. He wanted it to be dramatic, whether he succeeded or not. Like he was writing in order to achieve an effect and you can feel his presence and it's exciting. Yeah. So in that sense, yeah, that's what's great about this movie. And it is fun. Yeah. And it is and it's it maybe it is a little churlish to me to say like every third Jason Statham movie should have this. I just feel like the batting average could be a little higher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, and I think it is also fair to just say, man, some people are good at one thing and very few people are good at everything. And that's where Ian's going to say, but it looks like Spielberg wrote the scene so that the music would punctuate, so that it would set up the music to make the point or punctuate it. Why doesn't anybody do that? Mm-hmm. Like he's gonna have a joke, and it's gonna be set up for this other aspect. Or when he grabs his, he actually pulled the crystal skull. The timing of the Great film, American classic, <laughs> love it. The best, time, best in the end, Jones movie. All the timing of of the cuts and the action through the warehouse, leading up to hats and whips and music. And the jokes of all of it, like, is like it was all built for all of it to work together. Why can't they do it so that all of it works together? Yeah. And I think there's two answers to that. Number one answer is Steven Spielberg. Tom Cruise is not actually the messiah of cinema. Steven Spielberg is. I mean, he was born, he was born to this. He is, he is something special. He's a good writer. He's a good, I mean, Steven Spielberg is just good at everything in a way that Christopher McQuarrie and others aren't. Also, they should be trying. They should be trying harder. Very well, they few should be bringing in more people. Right. If you're not good and at... And if you're Cruise, you can afford to do that, right? Well, and he did. I mean, that's the thing. That's where this series has kind of shifted a little bit. I would say in the first two, you don't have to like the John Woo one. But in both cases, you're bringing in auteur directors, De Palma and John Woo, who are well-known and well-established outside of Cruise's milieu mm-hmm. for doing a certain thing and it's saying Tom Cruise is saying I'll handle the Tom Cruise parts but you guys I want you to give me as much of your flavor over there and so we're dividing and conquering now we're just getting Tom Cruise productions and they are good at what Tom is good at and bad at what Tom is bad at and Mm -hmm. luckily he's good at a great many things but yeah I mean you could I mean Robert Townsend the author of Chinatown wrote Mission Impossible 2 and it's a terrible terribly written movie but it just goes to show you can hire anybody if you're Tom Cruise. You could get Aaron Sorkin to come in and do a pass if you wanted to. And then you'd have some some dialogue or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Sorkin would be great to have go over the script even just once. Like it, You don't have to like Sorkin to just say, to be able to acknowledge that he would totally elevate the trash that this is. Like he would make it snappy and fun and he'd throw some quips in there. And Yeah. This is a bad dialogue movie for the most part. Not egregious mm-hmm. like a Batman Not Begins egregious. or Lucas stuff, but it's pretty bad. Although I think all the humor lands. I don't remember there ever being a part where 
there was a big moment that we were all supposed to laugh and it just fell flat. Like happens constantly in those Marvel things. Or Dial of Destiny. Or Dial of Destiny, yeah. Actually, yeah. they didn't even yeah. try to make jokes. Yeah, I was going to say, I was no. going to go to Dial of Destiny too, but then I was like, I don't think Mangold even cared to try There were him. There were a few jokes. Yeah, you had a lot of Phoebe Waller dri- bridge kind of You had written capitalism, stuff. Dog. You actually had, Dial of Destiny was better written than this movie, but it didn't matter. Yeah, in terms of the just, just line, Just line by line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it's trash. It was trash. Oh, Ben, how many keys out of I hope 40s? you would ask me Cruciform that keys. Cruciform keys. Out of 46? Out of 46, yes. Well, I don't really know. Let's just say 40. You know what? Actually, how old is Tom Cruise? Oh, my. He is 61. So out of 61, Cruise Form Keys. Same answer. Can you believe <laughs> how old that guy is? It's pretty funny. I mean, I can't think of a good one right now, but it's funny. 55. The internet are like, you know, this star when he was 60 and Tom Cruise when he's 60. I do. Well, he, he's older than, what's his face? The guy who p- played Jim Phelps in the first Mission Impossible movie. John Voight. John Voight, John, yeah. John Voight. He's older than John Voight was in, in 96. And John Very Voight's strange. like a John Voight's always man. looked old. Yeah, John Voight. Yes, Voight's, yeah. John Voight's one of those guys that probably suckled whiskey when he was two and was smoking cigarettes by the time he was five. And Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know why Tom Cruise does these dumb introductions where he's like, "I want to thank you for coming to the theater." Movies are. Mine didn't have that. Oh, mine did. No, I didn't get that. We didn't see it. I'm so happy. I did. I saw it in IMAX. No, you. That was the way to do it then, because I saw it in regular, and we got a dumb. No, no, we didn't get that. I was so happy not to see that old. Yeah, I was really excited. I was really happy because I was afraid of it because we got that with Maverick. Yeah, that was awful. Well, but in both cases, it's the same thing. It's like Tom Cruise usually. Probably gets a little digital de aging, to be honest, and also dunks his head in like ice yeah. water before every shot. But then he shoots this little promo, and he's like, he is, he does actually look like a jolly old man. Yeah, they've not tucked him, they've not pinned his skin back, they've not de aged him. Yeah. And, and he's sitting with McQuarrie, who's probably, I mean, how old is McQuarrie? I wonder if McQuarrie is younger than him. No, I doubt it. Christopher McQuarrie is. Not listed in terms of his age. Wikipedia decided to be woke and not list people's ages if they didn't want to. And I bet you Dead Reckoning or, you know what? I bet you Mission Impossible 9 is a de-aged film. What do you want to bet? It wouldn't shock me at all. I mean, I, I think Tom Cruise is on board probably with the talk. Yes, McQuarrie is younger. He is 54 years old. All right. He is a good five, six years younger than Tom Cruise. Rebecca Ferguson... Still 39, actually. Whereas Haley Atwell, 41. So he actually did trade up for an older woman. Just happened to be a curvier. An older woman who felt younger. Who felt like yeah. she was about 35 or something. My goodness. I bet you anything. They just took all of that stuff and said, this, all right, we're throwing it in the can. This is a learning process. By the time we're done, we're going to have built the first fully de-aged movie or something like that. But they're not the people to innovate it. They're the people to wait until it's accepted, to wait till it's been improved on, and then take it and try to make it make the cool version of it. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, do, actually doing the whole it. movie solves McCory's problem. Right. I mean, because even if you're noticing it for the first 10 minutes, eventually you give up and just are okay with it. You're either, you're, well, you're either okay with it or you're not. McCory's logic, by the way, is the logic of why you don't have nude scenes. It's impossible to ever have a nude scene that's not about Jennifer Connelly decided to get naked for this movie. There's no such. I mean, there's also the moral element. But if that didn't convince you, folks, I think philosophically, the intrinsic problem with nude scenes in movies are that there are always about the fact that they are they are about nudity instead of about whatever the scene is supposed to be about. Jake, how many? Cruciform tablets out of... Tablets? Cruciform keys? Cruciform keys, keys out of 61? 49. How, wait, how old is Jennifer? 39. Yeah, okay, for Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson, yeah. And Vanessa Kirby, of course. The White Widow is 35 years old. So you gave it 39 out of 61? Okay, here's the drink. Oh, yeah, that was really bad. I'll give it 49. I, I'm, I'm yeah. amazed. I, I rated it higher than Jake. Ha! Yeah. Wow. Or, 
I found the quote. You want the quote? Let's, let's hear the quote. Originally, there had been a whole sequence at the beginning of the movie that was going to take place in 1989. We talked about it as a cold open. We talked about it as flashbacks in the movie. We looked at de-aging. One of the big things about it I was looking at while researching, I kept saying, boy, this de-aging is really good, or this de-aging is not so good. Never did I find myself actually following the story. I was so distracted by how an actor that I had known for however long was now suddenly this young person. In researching the technology, I cracked the code, I think, on how best to approach it. But by then, we kind of moved away from it. We may still play with it. We never say never. So this isn't the full quote. This is from an article. Because there's more to the quote that I saw about the distracting, sort of the philosophical distracting, don't do anything. Right. Makes total sense. I mean, that was the, one, of the, one of the many problems with the opening of Indiana Jones is that although... Not a problem for Ian and not That's a problem true. for my wife and not a problem for lots of people. Yeah, and I think that you, the more that you've grown up with the all kinds of weird CGI type stuff, the less of a problem that's going to... Yeah, I mean, we are kind of old men be. in this regard. I think for Zoomers, probably not as big of a deal. Not as big. I mean, they have filters that they grow right, up every with. Every Instagram and... pic they've ever posted has been not actually a picture of them, but a picture of whatever their photograph app of choice did with their face and with their current complexion and mm-hmm. all kinds of that's, stuff that's like just, that. It's that's just, just life, baby. Everything's digitally mediated. So in a way that's not real. How many cruciform swords did you give? Mm. Swords, swords. You now? keep changing what they are. You give <laughs> keys, tablets, swords. Keys, 55. Oh, wow. Okay. That's high. And then you gave 49. 49. 49. Yeah, I'll give, what is it? 60, 61. 61. 61. Uh, yeah. I'll give 61. It's a masterpiece. Drop everything. See it now. In IMAX. In IMAX. Eat your popcorn. You guys see that creepy Tom Cruise at his most soulless used car salesman where he's it's like a little clip of him eating popcorn. I saw that it's going around, but I didn't actually watch it. It's pretty funny just in terms of like uh, just Tom Cruise being Tom, charmingly sociopathic. He's, I love popcorn. Movies? Popcorn. I'm going to eat my popcorn. And watch my movie, and then he takes a bite, and that's the clip. Good stuff. No, I, I, I don't know. I'll give it 45, I guess. I'll give it an extra five for Haley Atwell, though. I thought she was really refreshing. So she's probably the reason that I'd want to see this one again over Rogue Nation's relative boringness of seeing it again. Like, hey, hey, the character that I kind of liked. That mm-hmm. was nice. A relationship that I kind of liked. Yep. It turns out that those are the things that are exciting to go back to after you've seen the action. Ving Rhames gets to sit in a chair. That's all he does in these movies. He has a couple lines. He gets to say, Ethan! Ethan! Or, Ethan is my friend. It really didn't feel like maybe he wasn't even, like he came in for a week, <laughs> sat in a chair in front of a green screen, and they shot all of his stuff. Like, Ving Rhames. That's all he's ever been in these. I mean, that, that's not true. In the first one, he had a character to play. In the second one, he played the same character. The second one, his van gets blown up, and he, like, runs from it. He has to grab his computer. You know, he used to be he'd get a scene of at least standing up. Yeah. I'm not convinced that we actually get to see him standing in this movie. To be fair, if somebody's going to go like disarm a bomb or something, that's what you give Benji to do at this point. So, well, yeah, Benji's always had his like, I want to be in the field. Right. Now that I'm in the field, oh no, I'm afraid. I guess it's fine. He's got like three <laughs> things. So, but it also just feels like that, that keep him from being a Ving Rames redundancy. Right. Yeah. You don't need two guys that just, I don't Our know. Are guys in the chair? I feel like maybe Ving Rames couldn't even do, like, he feels like he came in for a few days. Maybe they even had to cut his part short. Like, he's like, I'm going to go off and, and do something by myself. Oh. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson can't wink. Did you guys see that bit of tri- trivia? No. no. She's literally unable to close one eye and keep the other one open. It's just something she can't do. So they designed an entire sequence around her wearing a cool eye patch which only exists in the movie because of her inability to do the most close basic. one eye while she's uh, looking through a scope to yep. take a shot. Huh. She, she cannot, she could not do those sniper scenes. So they're like, here's a cool character thing. She's got like an eye patch, which was a super fun thing for the trailer that Rebecca Ferguson had an eye patch. Uh, okay. I think we've said absolutely everything. There's nothing else to say about this movie. Nope. Right. Yeah. It would be. Yeah. Rank them real quick. Rank them. There's, that's the other thing. Hmm. Five, six, seven, four, one, three, two. 
Five six seven four one three two. That sounds very close to being accurate, Ben. No. Four one seven six five two three. That's accurate. Mm. Two over three, huh? Yeah, I think so. I hate three so much. In I'm terms- sure. I'm sure that I'm wrong, but I'm sure. But I. And let me say that I. I, I stuck up for. I, don't think I stuck fair. up for three a little bit, but three is dead last, below the bottom of the barrel in terms of what I would actually want to watch again. I'd way rather watch the goofiness of two. So just just in terms of what I want to watch right now, I'll go s- seven, five, six, four, one, one, two, yeah. three. Four below these last three. That's amazing to me. Uh, oh. I'm kind of with Jake. Four, four is obviously objectively better. It's like, got a lot of good to it, but it's like... Brad Bird's a better filmmaker than McCoy. The Prison Escape, the Burj Khalifa, these are better sequences. I mean, it is objectively a better movie, I think, but... It's not a better Mission Impossible movie, though. Like, you don't go to these movies to get... I mean, I think that's part of the issue. And then the whole end is so anticlimactic. Yeah, I do not like the sandstorm, and I do not like the the garage See, stuff. Yeah, to me, the sandstorm in the, in the parking garage just sort of hang over the film as, like, why couldn't we end with the Burj Khalifa going somewhere instead of like it, it just felt like huh but i've uh, not seen any of these movies since they were in the theaters so i'm working entirely with my impressions of them at the time uh, yeah actually the one that i would re- most like to watch maybe right now, the second if you pointed a gun at my head is number one because i haven't seen that one probably since the 90s and i think it'd probably be fun to reevaluate yeah i mean it's just a different movie yeah it's just different genre it's a different genre it's a different thing it's just like it's a Brian De Palma joint with a character that is going to be totally reinvented. Yeah, well, it's the only one that actually feels like maybe it's a, a movie movie. A yeah, mis- like a, a movie right. movie. And it and is. A, and and it Impossible is. It probably movie. is. Yeah. It, I think it's probably, without doubt, the best movie movie of all of them. But it, in terms of the franchise, it's so right. I put it at after four, towards the bottom. Because it's just like, it just doesn't fit in the franchise. So, and that's why my frame is as a standalone prequel by an auteur director who had respect for the property mm-hmm. and came back to it and wanted to revisit it post facto and de-age everybody. That's a that's one way that you can... <laughs> that's one way to make it work. It's kind of like that tension in the beginning thing. Like It feels totally different, humorless, violent. I mean, at no point has any of these movies actually felt like what my idea of the TV show is, which is that it was like actually about a team that had to do a thing and then they would do the thing and there'd be like espionage and stuff. This has always been a Tom Cruise star vehicle from the very first movie. And I'd love to see an actual movie about an actual team that did actual team stuff. That could be fun. I guess I can always watch Liam Neeson's The A-Team. Classic of cinema. Folks, that's pure Ooh. sarcasm. Do not watch that. You shouldn't joke around about something like that. Until next time. I'm going to kill you and your God. Wow. Harsh. Man. That's the only memorable line in the whole movie. What do you think? I can't think of another one before the music nope. lines up or runs out. <laughs> Ethan! <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>